All right, welcome everybody to the rare and mythic portion of the Modern Horizons 3 limited level up set review. We're back again. This is day two. And I think we're mostly just going to jump into the action here. There's not too much to cover. One thing I will say, just to kind of prep you for the kinds of cards we're going to be looking at today. We mentioned this yesterday, but a lot of the rares are not your classic limited bombs. Like you might see in some other sets. They're a little more synergy based. Some of them we're just going to pass off as being like, yeah, this is just a constructed card. We don't have to think about this for too long. Um, but I do think for people that maybe you know are worried about the increased power level of the sets or a little bit uh, anxious about that, one thing is that I don't think you're just going to be hit over the head with like nasty bombs every single draft. I think a lot of the uh, power is coming from the commons and uncommons, which I think is overall a good thing. Yeah, yeah I, start, I don't know if I'm just speaking for myself here, but I definitely spend less time significantly looking at the rares and mythics before we do these reviews, mm -hmm. but I still do a couple passes through quickly, just get an idea of a sense, and that does come in useful. You know, last time when reviewing OTJ, uh, we saw just so many busted green rares and helped us figure out that green was going to be pretty good, and that was a, a bold prediction that proved to be pretty true. <laughs> So, yeah, today I do like it when sets have the uncommons slightly better than the commons and the rares slightly better than the uncommons. You kind of, you kind of want, like, a, a gradual incline there. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that this set, most of the rares are weaker than a lot of the stuff we saw yesterday. So I think this might be, we'll call it maybe a popper format. And uh, maybe, you know, if you, if you don't know what that is, I would say the last popper format we had was probably DMU. Mm. So a lot of commons dominating strategies type of thing. Yeah, DMU was, I think, notable for a lot of people going like, oh, I wish the rares were even a little bit better. Because so much of the yeah. time it was like yeah. a dual land or a card that didn't matter much or some constructed card. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I think we'll just jump into it. I guess one last thing just to prep us for going forward is there are the, the main, card, main uh, set cards that we're going to talk about first. Then at the end, we're going to get to the reprint bonus sheet, Rares and Mythics. We touched on the uncommons and uncommons from that reprint bonus sheet. And also there are special guests and some commander cards that are actually in the set. So we'll, we'll get that when we get to it. But let's just start off here with Genku Future Shaper. This is two blue-white for a legendary creature at rare. It's a 2-5. And it says, whenever another non-token permanent you control leaves the battlefield, choose one that hasn't been chosen this turn. Create a creature token with the with those characteristics. And there's three options here. Either a 2-2 two, two, white fox with vigilance, a 1-2 merfolk with flying, or a 1-1 one, one black rat with lifelink. Genku also has the ability 3 blue white. Put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature you control. Yeah, not just the tokens for mm -hmm. that ability. So very... I mean, we talked about the rares not being good. This one looks pretty good to it me. Does. It, it doesn't say non-land. It says non-token. So... Yep. Talked a lot of time, spent a lot of time talking about fetch lands yesterday. Those are going to trigger this. Mm -hmm. uh, we also talked about, you know, niche spots that you might want the... Um, Shrieking Drake? The Shrieking Drake, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the revive itself, and you can kind of machine gun out tokens, three per turn, or that kind of thing here. So there's some sweetness to this card, for sure. Yeah, Shrieking Drake, by the way, is that uh, blue one-drop flyer that can pick itself up infinite times if you just want uh, to trigger revolt forever yeah card's pretty good uh it's got a nice beefy butt too so it can block pretty well the turn it comes down which is kind of what you want for these when i untap i do some good stuff kind of cards L let's just say you don't have a combo card with it a fetch land um it's going to still mess up combat a little bit where your opponent's going to be unlikely to want to block blue white i think is going to be slightly more tempo based more aggressive so i think this is a pretty good one not a Busto Bomb, but I would give Genku a B plus. That's what I wrote as well. Great. Starting off on the same page. Nice, great. Okay, next up, we've got ooh, a cool callback here. Psychic Frog. So this is blue-black for a frog at rare. It's a 1-2. And it says, whenever Psychic Frog deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, draw a card. Has an ability, discard a card. Put a plus one, plus one counter on Psychic Frog. Also has another ability. Exile three cards from your graveyard. Psychic Frog gains flying until an turn. So, of course, a callback to Psychotog. Yeah, you got to almost say it faster to get the, the distinction. Psychic Frog. Yeah, you know, Psychic Frog. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds, sounds a little closer that way. But, uh, yeah, did, I mean, I mean, I guess you weren't playing when, uh, when Psychotog was standard legal, but that was a uh, heck of a card back then. Yeah, I was... Uh... 
probably like just come out of kindergarten at that point. I think I, I, the magic oh, was just, God, I know, I just make me feel so all of them. A twinkle in my eye at that point. Uh, but this this is a really threatening two drop. Like this is something your opponent is going, going to be sad to see on turn two. Yeah, that threat of you know no mana, discard a card, plus one plus one counter. We've seen cards that grew you know plus one plus one and i think there was what, so until end of turn mm -hmm. we've yep. seen some and they were still pretty good and this is like permanent plus one plus one counter modifies it refills it if you do you know discard a card um you're potentially drawing that back and then you're fueling your your flying abilities there and there's not a lot of other things that are going to put stress on your graveyard like so you should be well stocked mm -hmm. In the mid to late game, I think this card's excellent. Yeah, I think it's excellent too. And, and one thing is like, you might be a little bit worried of these kind of cards of like going for the discard and the opponent casts a removal spell in response. Well, sure, th there's a few things that really get you. There's like the murder variant, but even the galvanic discharge, the shock, like sometimes you're just going to go, all right, like I'll, I'll put two counters in my thing. And yeah, now I still have a large creature. I get out of range of the deal three, or I guess no, it's not a shock, it's a bolt, but. You, you can have some counterplay to that where sometimes you're like, oh, I don't actually need this clunky spell in my hand. I'm fine pitching another thing to it to counter your removal spell. So, yeah, Psychic Frog seems really great. Good early, good late. Is it just an A? A minus? Yeah, I think it's an A minus yeah. for me. And uh, interestingly with Discharge, if you have, like, infinite energy, you, you kind of got to decide mm. how much you want to spend. Yeah. Like, you know, if your opponent has four cards in hand, are you okay dealing this thing just five damage and giving them the option to you know pitch their whole hand to save that one extra energy so yeah there's gonna be some nice uh, tension with this thing yeah really difficult card to uh to really play against all right what do we have next you're on a for a psychic frog oh sorry yeah i was gonna give an a minus a minus for psychic okay, frog. Okay, okay okay all right next we have Imskir Iron Eater, six black red for a five five demon. It has affinity for artifacts, meaning it costs one less for each artifact you control. When it enters the battlefield, you draw X cards and you lose X life, where X is half the number of artifacts you control rounded down. And then also has an ability for three and a red, sacrifice an artifact, deals damage equal to the sacrificed artifact's mana value to any target, which is a callback to Bosch Iron Golem. Yeah, yeah. So we were saying yesterday, how do you get into red-black if the deck does not seem all that good? Is this a good enough reason? I, like, how many artifacts do you even want for this? Because <laughs> once you have, like, tons of them, this card might be bad again. Right. Yeah, you're just like, uh-oh, I actually can't cast this sometimes. Like, obviously, on your, in your opening hand, it's just going to be a nice little curve out where you refill and draw two cards or something. But, yeah, sometimes you're just going to be like, I actually can't cast this card because it just kills me or puts me dead to my opponent's attacks. Yeah, like the second ability is nice with other affinity cards because they cost less, mm -hmm. but they still retain their retain their mana value for throwing them at things. But I don't even think this card's like that good. No, I think it's okay. Like it is, uh, I think the answer to my question, if I'm going to answer my own question is, it is like a, a pretty good card in that deck, but not a, it's a reward, not a reason if you want to use that uh, terminology. Huh. Like with with three artifacts, this thing costs. It's a five mana five five that draws you one card and loses you one life, which is like a common level card, kind right? Of. And so you need like four artifacts for two cards, two life costs four, and then you're starting to get something decent. Yeah, and it's not super clear that that last ability is actually going to be something you want to spend four mana on uh, after you untap with it, right? Like you just have drawn a few cards, probably. And it's four mana, unless you actually have one of those expensive affinity cards, like, you're not dealing that much damage for your four mana. Yeah, damage doesn't stack anymore. <laughs> yeah, damage <laughs> does not stack. It would make the card better. That's what, uh, you know, Bosch had an advantage over this card. So, I think we do have to give it somewhat of a, not even a build around. I think, you know, I, a, a lot of the grades in this set review, in the Modern Horizon set review, I think we're probably just... We did this yesterday. I think we should probably do this today. I'm just understanding that if you're reading these cards, you kind of understand where they go. And uh, I would say the same for this one. I think in the affinity deck, this card is going to be like a C plus. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you there. Okay, great. C plus for Imskir. Next up, we've got Roshin, Roaring Prophet, two green red for a four four legendary creature at rare. When it enters the battlefield, you mill six cards, then you may put a card with X and its mana cost from among them into your hand. 
You can also tap Roshin to deal uh, to reveal any number of cards with X in their mana costs in your hand. Add Colorless Colorless for each card revealed this way. Spend this mana only to uh, only on costs that contain X. So I will admit I have done my homework for a few of these. I yep. do know how many hits there are in the set for this. And it's not much, right? There's five. Yeah. Yeah. So there's the Hydra common that we saw yesterday. Mm -hmm. And the Meltdown, which is a sideboard card that we saw yesterday in the New to Modern section. And then there's three white cards, which kind of makes it awkward with this. So there's the Decree of Justice. There's the Wrath. And, oh, sorry, and the last one's Colorless, is the Kozilek's Command. So it's a couple of rares we're going to see today. Right. But, yeah, two white cards, a red card, a green card, and an, and an artifact card. Colorless card. The Cree of Justice is pretty cool with this thing. Uh, that's, like, you know, find a little more often. I, I think that's something that will come up, you know, once in a blue moon in the format. But this is also probably a rare you're going to get pretty late. And if you're like, oh, okay, I've got a Hydra and I've got a Decree of Justice, like, maybe I play it. Like, here's the thing. Six cards, milling six cards, uh, I think to be likely to hit, like, and when I, when I say likely, I'm like 70% plus, you still need to have, like, six cards in your deck. To, to be able to hit and draw a card off of this yeah so even like with like three potential hits off this it's you're probably still better off just playing like the you know four four modified yeah. trampler something else from yesterday so I, i'm interested in seeing some screenshots when people do kind of go off with this because mm -hmm. especially if you hit one and have one in hand and you get that tap for four mana and kind of go nuts it's mm -hmm. kind of cool but, uh, yeah, I, I don't think this card's very good. Yeah, and 4 mana 4-4 four, four is not a good baseline in a Modern Horizon set, so I want to just give Roshin a D? Yeah. Okay, D for Roshin. We've got Kudo, King of Monks, Bears, up next. This is green-white for a 2-2 two, two legendary creature at rare. Other creatures have base power and toughness 2-2 two, two, and are bears in addition to their other types. Yeah, so kind of... A sweet card. I mean, the the joke with this is you have Eldrazi spawn, mm -hmm. you have uh, modified creatures, especially like the the Watchdog yep. we saw yesterday. It's a five five with this. That Watchdog, we just keep keep bringing it up. Like there's like so yeah. many things that that play well with that Watchdog. Yeah, there's ba there's barely any downsides to have. Like there's one, you know, the Slith of Black Slith removes counters, but I don't think anything else punishes the fact that it's like a zero mana three counter thing. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the downside is that this is everything. So if your opponent has a bunch of Eldrazi spawn, like you want to cast this when you have more creatures on the board than your opponent. Right. Yeah. That's that's kind of the real symmetry breaker. Or if you're like super heavy modifying. Um, I guess kind of cool. You can set something up where you attack with small creatures and then they block with bigger ones and you play as post combat to kill some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's some cool play patterns with this and, and i do think this i mean we talked about just not giving build around grades but mm -hmm. you do want to be like wide low to the ground not have many big creatures uh so you do need a specific deck for this to be safe to play otherwise right. it could be a card you could you could board in in some matches right like if you're if you're not the perfect deck for this and you, you don't you don't have a ton of creatures but then you play against somebody who's like you know, just some rampy deck with huge monsters and not a ton of Eldrazi spawn. Mm -hmm. Like, this could be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the question is, is it more like I'm just going to play this most times when I'm green-white and sometimes it's awesome, or I'm not going to play it most times when I'm green-white. I have to have a deck that I have a high density of things is good with. And I think it's more the second one. Yeah, I think it's like a C for that reason. Yep. Yeah, I would agree okay. with that. Like, keep your eye on it. It's it's a good card to speculate on if you're already kind of in this space, but you might not include it in your final deck. Yeah. All right. What do we have next? Abstruse appropriation. I, I'm not. Do you know what abs abstruse is? I, I do not. Know. No. Okay. Well, <laughs> chat, chat. As we're reading it, uh, you can tell us what abstruse means. Yeah. Somebody look it up. But yeah, two white black for an instant, which is devoid for some reason because this is white black. But sure. Mm -hmm. uh, exile target non-land permanent. You may cast that card for as long as it remained exiled, and you may spend colorless mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell. Okay, so it's like a hostage taker spell instead of uh, on a creature, or like fractured identity that you have to actually cast the card. It's pretty good, all around pretty good. Um, quite good. Actually. Notably, you do need color. Like if you're not, if it's not a white or black card you're exiling, you need colorless mana to cast blue, red, right. and green cards. 
Yes. Yeah. And that's not going to be trivial. Actually, it's going to be pretty rare for your white black deck. Yeah, it's well, so we talked about the white black uh, fetches being slightly, slightly, slightly less needed than the other colors mm -hmm. yesterday when we were talking about those uh, those fetch lands. And this is a reason to think twice before cracking those fetch lands because you're going to want multiple of them if you get if you drop this into your deck. Right. Yeah. And by the way, chat saying that uh, abstruse basically means obscure or difficult to understand. Okay. Yeah. I, I will try to use that in a sentence sometime soon. <laughs> All right, so again, you got to pick up some colorful sources, but uh, you know, it, it's the black white land probably going to be, or the black white lands probably going to be ones that are a little bit easier to pick up. I think I would just give this like a, it's it's a strong spell, and so with the support, oh, it's very good. Yeah, very it's very good. very good. Um, I think I would give it an A minus. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, because sometimes it's just it is going to be just the four mana exile something, which is passable. Um, but yeah, when you get your thing, it's great. All right, here's another cool callback. White of the Reliquary, like a zombie. This is green, black for a 2-2 creature at rare. It's got Vigilance, and it gets plus one, plus one for each creature card in your graveyard. Also has the ability tap, sacrifice another creature, search your, search your library for a land card, put it onto the battlefield, tapped, and then shuffle. Yeah, so just like Knight of the Reliquary, it's not necessarily a basic. It's any land. Mm-hmm. Um, so this, I'm imagining there's probably some crazy things you can do and constructed with this, uh, but for limited, it's still quite a good card. Yeah, it's it's just gonna be like a two two that keeps growing with the as the game goes on. You could sacrifice a spawn token to turn into a permanent mana source. That's kind of interesting, mm -hmm. although it doesn't grow in your grave or doesn't grow the uh, the white doesn't put something in the graveyard. It's also a free sack outlet for the cards that we've talked about that kind of uh, matter there. Yeah, it like blanks removal on your other creatures once you know once you're on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, it protects itself slightly because if again if you're on top of it, they try and point two damage at it. You can just throw something else away. Yeah, it it's also really sweet, and really good. Yeah, 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 I like it a lot. Um, let's see, we want to give it a somewhere between B plus and A minus. I think I'm going to probably give it a B plus because it is like. Yep. Slightly, you know, finicky. Slightly not, not always going to be just actually excellent, but yeah, it's pretty good still. Yeah, and this does. We uh, talked about the the card I loved yesterday, the green common where you mill four and you put a permanent in your hand. Mm, like, yeah, really nice. Really nice. Type of thing. Yeah, that's an, that's another thing to look out for. Just like any amount of any number of things that put things that just you know look at the top, put the rest in your graveyard. There's also like the the blue green uh, impulse growth spiral that that puts cards in your graveyard too. You know, the three colors, but. Uh, it's gonna happen sometimes. Yep. Oh, here's here's a really strong one. This is Nadu Winged Wisdom. This is one blue green for a rare legendary creature. It's a three four flyer. So three mana three four flyer. Creatures you control have the ability. Whenever this creature becomes the target of a spell or ability, that's for both players. Reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, uh, put it into your hand. This ability triggers only twice each turn. Not just once, only twice. And just like some of the cards we saw yesterday, that is for each creature. Each creature has that ability, so each creature can have that trigger twice per turn. Yeah, and this is whenever it's either player targets. Mm -hmm. So you can you can pump your creatures, you can equip them, you can you know let your opponent target stuff at it. And there's just yeah, this card is is insanely good. Fight spells work really well with it they just they just can trip and it's huge and it's, it's yeah huge. It's, <laughs> it's a huge flyer yeah like this has to be dealt with before anything else can be dealt with and your opponent won't always be able to deal with it and when they do you get a card out of the deal yeah we've seen like the play boosters have really juiced up blue green right mm -hmm. like we saw yeah <laughs> with like bonnie paul and, and even oko and we saw MCAM with Doppelgang and uh, the thing that manifested all of your stuff. Like, the, so, yeah, so many good blue-green rares. This this might be one of the best cards in the set. Yeah, they got the message with blue-green. So I think it's really just, is this an A or an A+. Plus? And yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of in the middle of the two grades mm -hmm. as well. I would probably lean A, just because when you draw it on turn 4, 5, 6, it's going to be good, but not just as backbreaking as it would be on turn 3. That said, I agree. It's going to be one of the best cards in the set. So I'm just going to give it an A. 
Sure, I'm, I'm with you. Sweet. Okay, what's next? Invert polarity. Blue, blue, red for an instant. Choose target spell, then flip a coin. If you win the flip, gain control of that spell, and you may choose new targets for it. If you lose that flip, counter the spell. Hmm. Wow. That's a powerful effect. <laughs> so, I've seen some people somewhat unhappy about this the card, this card's existence. Uh, just because it's extremely swingy. Like, <laughs> when you win the flip, you can get, feel really bad about it. Well, also, I mean, I'm... this For me, this is a cancel. For my opponents, this is a desertion. Right, so right. <laughs> yeah, and desertion costs, what, like six, seven mana around there? Uh, five. Yeah, but oh, only sorry, hits five, five. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was thinking yeah. uh, Commandeer. Yeah, this card is great. Like it, it's the 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 floor is a cancel, which is passable, and when you win the flip, you, you it's just a massive swing in the game, just gigantic. Yeah. To be clear, you gaining control of that spell means like if it's a creature, you know, it's it's coming in on yep. your side. Mm -hmm. You get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> good. It's a good card. Yeah, it is a very good card, and it's a little bit of a tricky mana cost, but that's okay. Often, you know, it, you're not always going to want to cast this on turn three, even. So I think like mind control for something on the stack in split card. How do the, or, or sorry and uh, cancel split card that you don't get to choose. How does that balance out? Probably to like it, it a minus, right? I was thinking B plus. B plus. Uh, yeah, just because it is hard to cast, and if you do, I, I, again, that's partly my expectation of how my games will play out. Because if you have <laughs> three mana open, again, your opponents. Are already kind of incentivized mm -hmm. to play around counters, so they're not likely to jam their biggest thing. Yeah, that is definitely true. They're also like this set is also pretty packed with large, impactful spells. So for sure, you're gonna get something really good sometimes. Yeah, I'm gonna stick with my A minus, but yeah, yeah, strong card, really strong card. We got we got a new Theros Titan in the cycle here, Flage Titan of Fier Fire's Fury. This is one red white for a six six legendary creature at mythic and of course it's got the uro croaks text when it enters the battlefield sacrifice it unless it escaped when it enters the battlefield or attacks it deals three damage to any target and you gain three life escape cost is red red white white and you exile five five other cards from your graveyard if you haven't played with escape before basically just if this is in your grave you can just bring this back to the battlefield uh, by or actually it's casting it so you get to cast it from your grave by paying the mana and that exile five cards cost wow yeah yeah so i mean three mana sorcery speed lightning helix is an okay card mm -hmm. right like it's not busted it's pretty good still but though. yeah but you can you can pretty reliably escape this in in all like every game i'm pretty sure yeah in the chat's uh mentioning like we, we made the comment of like yeah not every rares in this set's busted but we just were like a a a we're at the gold cards which you know of course is a funny place yeah, honestly to start, this but... is what you want the gold cards to be yeah though, right like the hardest to cast ones should be the best ones and i also kind of like that the worst one we've seen so far by far is the red green one mm -hmm. because red greens commons and uncommons were rare level cards yesterday so I, I'm I'm all for this. Like, yes. I think this is good. And I also also yeah. nice with Flage here. Like it's not a splashable card really. Sure, you could splash the Lightning Helix front side, but red, red, white, white's just not splashable, so it's going to the red white player. Um yeah, is this uh I think this is probably just our first A plus. I'm gonna give this an A. Okay. And, and also this one is uh this is the first uh one that's a mythic, so mm -hmm. it's true this one will come up slightly less but yeah for you sure. want to go a plus for this yeah i'm gonna give a plus to it it's just yeah good on the front side great uh, insane threat that they have to deal with right away and gets value when you cast it again sure. all right what do we have next the necro bloom one white black green for a two seven legendary plant it has landfall whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control create a zero one green plant creature token if you control seven or more lands with different names, <laughs> create a 2-2 black zombie creature token instead. And then land cards in your graveyard have dredge two, meaning you can choose to return a land from your graveyard to your hand and mill two cards instead of drawing a card. Interesting is how I would describe this card. So this is a Field of the Dead callback. And an 0-1 plant token 
can be used to be sat. You know, you can sacrifice it. You can jump block with it. The dredge ability, of course, nice with the fetch lands. You can just keep drawing lands if you want, if that's what your hand demands. How doable the seven lands is? It's actually not too too bad with ten fetch lands at common. Fetch lands are yeah. rare. Like I actually think this this is probably one of the best sets this card could possibly be in for that that condition. For sure. The only issue is that the tension of you wanting to leave your fetch lands around makes it a heck of a lot harder to cast yes. one white, black, green. For sure. On anywhere close to on curve, right? But then you dredge it. <laughs> you dredge the lands back. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I only think, so notably, I only think you ever want to dredge if you're giving yourself like a double trigger, mm -hmm. right? Like if you can mm -hmm. dredge back a fetch, get a 2 2, sack it, get another 2 2. Yes. Like, it's not worth doing it if you're not at that seven or more lands. Like, just just draw your card for the turn. It may be a different land already. It may be a spell. You know, it's... Yeah, yeah. I'm just, just warning people, don't use that dredge ability unless it's going to be really good for you. Yeah, and of course, uh, MDFCs count for this too. I didn't count... I didn't shut that out. Yeah, sure. Good yeah. point, yeah. Yeah, I, I think this card is going to be more, uh, like... <laughs> opportunistically good rather than like oh i should take this and draft around it um it also doesn't play necessarily that well with the obs on theme of modified doesn't modify creatures doesn't like help your modified creatures so it's 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 more of a niche thing than just a card i think you should build around i think it well, I, I do I, again I'm, I'm i like that too right yeah give, for give, sure there's a reason to do something different other than yeah advertised uh archetypes yeah, I think it's probably, like, if you're a black-green deck, I can see you splashing white for this card, just being a little bit yeah. more, you know, uh, a little bit more late-game focused. I think that evens out to probably, like, a build around C. Yeah, well, I think if you are building around it, it's going to be good. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give it a build around C+. Plus. Okay, sorry, was that B plus or C plus? C plus. Okay, C plus, yeah, yeah that's totally fine. Okay. All right, we've got Anna Kenrid, Sky Captain, as uh, another mythic here. Two and Esper, so two white, blue, black for a 4 4 legendary creature at Mythic. It's got flying and lifelink. It also has a ward ability when the ward cost is discard a card. When the when a modified creature you control attacks, double the number of uh double the number of each kind of counter on it. Then for each non-token permanent attached to it, so auras and uh and equipment, create a token that's a copy of that permanent attached to that creature. Okay. This card is also pretty nuts. Yeah, it's great. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, you're good. If you make so, if you have a living weapon creature token, mm -hmm. you just get another living weapon with a with another germ, right? Like you basically the the living weapon equipment would be attached to the um, attacking creature, but then it would the trigger would resolve and it would get moved over to the to the germ. Is that right? Oh, is that how it works? I I assumed that it would be the opposite. Where oh oh yeah, I see what you're saying because the living weapon says create zero zero and attach it to this when it comes in. Yeah, I think so. Right? Yeah, I, th I that's that makes intuitive sense to me. If chat has a disagreement with that, I it would obviously be good to hear that. But I I think we'll go with that's how it works, which is cool. I think that's a little bit better than not the other way. Maybe not, because you you like if you want to be able to get your creature, like you want to have to be able to attack to mm -hmm. get the trigger, mm -hmm. and it'd be safer for you to attack if the creature was suddenly going to sure. get massive, right? Yeah, that is fair. It also uh, with bestow, just to be clear, it, it will the the aura will become an aura attached to the creature attacking. Like it's not going to create it, a a non aura bestow creature on the battlefield. It'll create a, a copy of the Bestow Aura, but it'll also then also become a, a creature. When, yes, when the afterwards, thing yeah, falls. right. Yeah, and, and like, you plus almost on counters, you know, every type of counter counts for this. Yeah, we, we're getting confirmation that it works the way you want it to with Living Weapon, so that's good. Well, how do you want it to? Yeah, I guess the way I want it to. <laughs> but like you mentioned, they both both are, they have their merits. Anyways, so rules things aside, we've got a 5 mana 4-4 four, four Flying Lifelink that has a ward cost that is not fun to pay. And that's just good. Uh, and it is in the modified colors, save for blue. So you might, you're you going to have to pick up some fixing that might not be uh, at the top of your priority list. But yeah, card's good. And it has like, the ability has pseudo haste, right? Because you right. can just play it and attack with the modified Yep, creature. whenever you attack. 
Yeah, this thing's excellent. I, I think this thing's like an A. Yep, I would also give Aunt Ar Arna an A. Cool. All right, we now move on to the monocolored card, starting with Guide of Souls. This is a single mana for a 1-2 rare. When another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain a life and get an energy. That's pretty good. And then whenever you attack, you can pay three energy. When you do, put a plus one, plus one counter and a flying counter on target attacking creature. It becomes an angel in addition to its other types. Good lord. Two plus one, plus one counters. Sorry, two, sorry, plus, two one, plus, one. plus one, plus one counters. <laughs> yeah, good lord. This card is great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, if we learned anything from Luminarch... Aspirants? Is that the card? Lunar, vet Lunar Veteran, right? That's the card? The uh, 1-1 yes, one from Lunar Midnight Hands? one that came to life when you had a creature come into play? Yeah, that that ability is, uh, I think, a little bit better than people might have given it credit for in the past. In limited, anyways. And, uh, yeah, just getting an energy on every single creature. It's not a non-token thing, so anything that makes tokens gets an energy, too. And then just, this thing doesn't have to attack. You can just sit there. Yeah, I, I kind of want to give this an A minus. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, maybe we're just gonna eat our words on these rares. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I was we'll would... delete that part in the edit. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. I gotta stop mentioning it so I don't have to edit out a million things. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would give Guy the Souls an A minus. Card looks great. All right, what is up next? Another white one drop. Yeah, we got Ocelot Pride, single white mana for a mythic cat. It is a 1-1 one, one with first strike, lifelink, and ascend, meaning if you control 10 or more permanents, you get the city's blessing for the rest of the game. And at the beginning of your end step, if you gained life this turn, create a 1-1 one, one white cat creature token. Then if you have the city's blessing for each token you control that entered the battlefield this turn, create a token that's a copy of it. Okay, so it's almost like a, on turn one, it's like a white ragavan in some ways, where your opponent just goes, ugh, okay. Hope I can answer that. It Yeah, a lot, a lot of words for, like, the ability's not that hard to understand once you once you read it. But, right. Uh, I also don't think this card's as good as the last one. No, I agree with that. I think if I had my choice of one drops, I'd take the last one. So I, I did do a search for this, and uh, I think it... it reads mostly like a black white card to me or not that it's not a card you're not going to play i think you're just going to play this in any white deck but if you want to maximize on the non uh like a non-combat way to gain life black white's got a decent density of that with some life and creatures some spells that gain life black white does have well I, the other idea is that if you want to get this into combat you want to suit it up mm -hmm. right like yeah totally so green might be the best color at actually getting this thing reliably into combat because mm -hmm. first strike lifelink doesn't need a ton of extra stats to be you know a terrifying monster in combat a yes. couple plus some counters turns this thing into a total nightmare um and then there's also the fact that it's not just the cats that you're duplicating if you do manage to have this survive or, or you know have gained life the turn you've had eldrazi spawn come into play you're getting extra eldrazi spawn True. too yeah and eldrazi spawn really help you get the city's blessing getting that 10 permanence and by the way if you haven't played with city's blessing something that kind of pops in your head is it is it non-lands or lands included lands are included with the city's blessing it's, it's fairly easy to turn on yeah yeah card's good um we gave the last one an a minus i think this one i'm gonna give it a b plus Yep, I'm right with you there. Great, B-plus for Ocelot Pride. Next up, we've got Argent Dias. This is one and a white for an artifact at rare. It enters the battlefield with two oil counters on it. Whenever two or more creatures attack, put an oil counter on Argent Dias. Then has the ability to and, to and tap it, remove two oil counters from the Dias, exile another target non-land permanent. Its controller draws two cards. Hmm. Not thrilled about this. Yeah. And of course, it's an artifact. All the artifacts suck at this set. That's just the, the theme, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, it's like something that you use to cash in your tokens. Mostly, I don't think you're you're not gonna want to exile your opponent's stuff very often. Right, and it does like it does trigger off both players attacking with two or more creatures. So if you know if you're racing, then you're potentially able to activate this every turn, but. You're going to run out of things you want to sacrifice real quick. It costs mana to use, too. Yeah. Two to play. Yeah. yeah, I think we're pretty off this. Uh, I, I think it's more of a D- than an F, because I think there might be niche spots where you play it, but I'll, I'll give it a D-. minus. 
I had just written D minus for myself Great. too. Yeah. Wow, we're in tune today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next one's cool. It's Felia Exuberant Shepherd. This is one in a white for a legendary dog at rare. It's a two two with flash. Two minute two two with flash. And then when it attacks, exile up to one other target non land permanent. At the beginning of the next end step, return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. If it entered under your control, you put a plus one plus one counter on Felia. Yeah, this thing's. I think this thing's kind of good. Mm -hmm. Me too. I heard. I can't remember. I was listening to some other set review. Might have been been Luca and Scotty, and I don't think they thought through how good this thing is. Right. You like the idea is. First of all, end of turn, you flash it in, your opponent doesn't know what's coming, you're probably, you know, you, you maybe get an attack in, you blink something of yours, which maybe comes with an advantage or not, but then you already have a 3-3 three, three that's threatening to snowball, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen, like, you know, March of the Black Gate type of cards where yep. it is a threatening thing to snowball. But you can also just exile an opponent's blocker. Like, you won't get the counter, but th this thing just removes a blocker every turn if you want it to. Kills a token? If you wanted to, right? Just It just doesn't say non-token. Yeah. You can just straight up delete a token from existence. Yeah, very flexible, very good, can snowball. That said... Yeah, so like the threat of this, that your opponent needs two blockers for it, and that's right. once they know about it. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think even yeah, if you just get like... your living weapon chat says too. That's Right, that's, yeah, that's... blink a living weapon. Yeah, the more, the more you talk about this card, the more you read and like consider the set context, the better it gets. Okay. Yeah, you can unmodify your opponent's creatures. There's... Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, blink their blink their uh, germ tokens. You want to have Philia an A minus, or maybe she's closer. I don't to want to go that high. Oh, I just talked wanna... it up a little bit. I'm still putting it as a B plus. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm done with that too. Very cool right. card though. Yeah, I like it a lot. All right, what is next? White Orchid Phantom. White, white for a 2-2 two, two flying first strike. When it enters the battlefield, destroy up to one target non-basic land. Its controller may search their library for a basic land card, put it onto battlefield tapped, then shuffle. So mostly white, white for a 2-2 two, two first strike flying, which is fine. Well, so, okay, I, I somewhat agree. But yeah. if your opponent ever has a... Um, uh, one of the fetch lands in play, you mm -hmm. always target it, right? Right, yeah, 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 no, I, I was going to mention that too, where it's like destroying their colorless source is, is going to matter like, some amount of the time. Yeah. Yeah, this is a solid card. It's it's nothing special, and like I think white, white, two drop is always a little bit, you know, stats-wise on 17 lands, these kind of cards always look a little bit worse than they, um, they I think they should look on 17 lands like grand arbiter from the last set white white two drop uh two minute two two that your opponent couldn't cast spells or activate abilities on your turn and, and that card's okay like it's nothing special but it had a really 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 poor win rate uh, probably because when you put it in a deck with a nine eight mana base it it's not castable on two very often yeah. right yeah. so you got to make sure you got the mana base for it 11 12 white sources but uh yeah if you do it's an above average two drop i think i'd give white or white orchid phantom c plus yeah, that, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Cool. Wrath of the Sky is up next. This is a X White White Sorcery. Oh, so there's your X spell. <laughs> X White White Sorcery at rare. You get X energy. Then you may pay any amount of energy. Destroy each artifact creature and enchantment with mana value less than or equal to the amount of energy paid this way. Yeah, I think this one's kind of tricky to mm -hmm. evaluate. It is. So... I think it's pretty good though. I I think like it's it, it does a lot of stuff. It can be just an energy generator, like just have a bunch of energy, just X white white make a bunch of energy. Or if you already got a lot of energy, it's a very cheap wrath effect. It's also modular, so that if you have the biggest thing, you can just kill all their small stuff and uh, you know keep your big thing around. Maybe even multiple things. Kills tokens for two mana. I'm somewhat unconvinced. Okay. So I think if you're just spending this to get energy, like let's say you're ahead on board and you know you just want energy, this the rate on this is terrible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that's not a, the a main draw to the card for sure. And then if you need this to be a wrath, like, what do you think? How much energy do you think you're gonna have to pay for this? Probably four or five. 
ish, maybe six, seven, even. Yeah, and oftentimes I, I guess to uh, you know play devil's advocate versus against myself is that you know when you want to wrath early a lot of the time it's going to be against a fast ramping out an Eldrazi start from the opponent, right? And you're just not going to be able to kill her seven and eights very often. Yeah, like even just to kill four drops, you need six mana. Like it's easy to say I'll have a lot of energy lying around, but your other cards also want you to spend energy mm -hmm. right like i yeah i i i don't think it's going to be the point where you top deck this and you'll have a lot of energy because typically if you have a lot of reserves and you don't have a way to use it in hand you're gonna spend it mm -hmm. so the only way where this like plays out ideally is if it's in your opening hand and then you kind of like build up to it by saving energy with your first couple of plays yep that makes sense and I, I kind of just yeah i kind of just don't think this card is is that good? Yeah, it's just like more hoops than it looks like on initial read, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I agree with that. So, still a reasonably powerful effect. You can't can't just write it off. But you're not. I don't think you're gonna first pick this or early pick this very often. I think this will have a, a very low number for an Alsa, but like it, it shouldn't. You're right. People are gonna take this very very people, highly. People will take it high. Which. Yeah. Means that its win rate on seventeen lands is going to be lower uh, uh, by you know as a result. If you if the card yeah. goes earlier than it should, then the win rate goes down. Yeah, so it's uh you know you're talking about a slower white deck that could exist. I guess that slower white deck also has to be making energy to some degree, unless you're you just want to yeah, pay a I've, bunch. I've written down my grade. I'll let you say what you're gonna. Yeah, I think yeah, it's it's definitely lower than my initial impression. I think I'm just gonna give Wrath of the Sky as a, a D plus. D plus? Yeah. I wrote C minus. Okay. Very similar. Yeah, yeah. Same enough. Okay, we've got our first mythic flipwalker here. So this is uh, a Johnny McCoddle Pariah. Don't forget, uh, the scene. Oh, Sorry, thank you. The scene. Yes, yes, yes. All right, there we go. <laughs> now you can see it. Now you can actually see the card. This is a 1 2. Oh, by the way, these are creatures in the front, planeswalkers in the back, and they all have a, a different flip condition to get to the planeswalker side. So this is a 1 2, uh, 2 mana 1 2, 1 and a white for a 1 2. It. Enters the battlefield, and it creates a 2-1 white cat warrior creature token. So it's a 1-2 that comes with a 2-1. Whenever one or more other cats you control dies, you can exile a Johnny, then return to the battlefield transformed under his owner's control. The Planeswalker side is a 3-loyalty Planeswalker with a plus 2 that says put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on each cat you control. <laughs> the 0 is create a 2-1 cat creature token. When you do, if you control a red permanent other than a Johnny... He deals damage equal to the number of creatures you control to any target. And then a negative four ability. Each opponent chooses an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker from among non lands they control, and they sacrifice the rest. I'm glad you read this one, because I am start I'm feeling a bit from yesterday. So it's, Oh yeah, uh, no worries. I'm I'm good. I'm energized. So okay. I'll read most but, of them. Uh, yeah, so not a lot of uh like if you're thinking, hey, there's a cat tribal deck, while well, we saw the mythic one drop cat a few cards ago. The only other cat in the set, I believe, is a four mana flying three two red thing that makes energy. Mm -hmm. uh, so barely any cats. But that being said, just having your two one token that this spots you makes still makes this excellent. Yeah, just the rate on the front side is just great. Yeah, and if you can like, this thing just stops your opponent from ever attacking right. or blocking your two one cat because if you flip this. Even if you don't have a red permanent, it protects itself by making two ones every turn for free. Mm -hmm. And if you do have a red permanent, then oh boy, you're going to you're going to town. Yeah, yeah, this card is quite strong. It like even I think often what's going to happen is you play this, they the opponent scrambles to kill the Ajani, and you're still left with a two one. Some percentage of the time, you get to flip the Ajani, but uh, yeah. Card's, card's very strong. Hmm. I'm thinking, like, in, in a non-red deck, it's somewhere between an A- minus and an A, and in a red deck, it's somewhere between an A and an A+. Plus. Yeah. It's just so much for so little mana. I you think just... give it, like, an A? Yeah, I was just going to even it out to an A. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, is there, like... There's not, like, too much hybrid in this set, if any at all. So it's not like you can randomly have a red, a red permanent sometimes. So you're you're mostly just gonna have to be red white. But 
Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're the heard. only color that you could get randomly is black, right? Because you can you can get black germ tokens. True. From that is funny. Hair. Yeah. And yeah. the the little like it, kind of a, a very wordy line of text for that middle ability. If you control a red permanent, it seems weird out of context. But the kind of the, the twist for all these planeswalkers is. They're monocolor on the front side, gold on the on the uh, other side, and whatever other color they are. So a Johnny is white. He turns into a red white creature. It'll care about uh, a a thing of that color. So just going forward for the other ones we see. Okay. Yeah, cool. and, and some of the color secondary colors matter a lot more than others, yes, as, as we'll see for sure. Okay, going on to our next card here, we've got Pearl Ear, Imperial Advisor. So this is one white white for a legendary creature at rare. It's a three four lifelink. So getting good starting base on here. Enchantment spells you cast have affinity for auras, <laughs> okay? And then whenever you cast an aura spell that targets a modified permanent you control, draw a card. Notably, that white-white cost, is it, it already hurts in a normal set. It'll hurt even more in a set where you might have a couple of waste-type mana sources mm -hmm. in your deck. Um, so that is, like, this is probably more of a four-drop-ish um but still i think i still think this card's good yeah and uh obviously that it's another again we said this yesterday but i'll bring it up again it's a line of text that like these both these lines of text seem uh not that relevant most of the time in limited but with bestow creatures running around you're gonna have you know in your modified decks quite a few auras that you can slap on uh yeah and if you if you draw one card off of this that's great if not your opponent's probably pointed a removal spell at this uh, three four life link, which you know, no protection or whatever, but that's not a big deal. So it's, it's pretty good, but it's you're not really gonna get to the ceiling all that often. I think it would give Pearl Ear a B. I I like this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I I'm not gonna do much higher, but I, th I think I'm gonna give it a B plus. Right, and, and that's like when you have this, you're prioritizing auras higher, right? Like, you're yeah, not like, just in for, like, 3-4 lifelink at that grade, anyways? All, all, not a B, B plus, but almost, right? Like, 3-4 sure. lifelink for 3. Yeah, even if you cast good. on turn 5 and, and double spell or whatever, because you don't have the white sources on turn 3. Mm -hmm. Still pretty good. And this thing is also, like, an excellent... Anytime you have nice keywords in a color pair that is trying to modify things, the mm -hmm. keywords are worth even more, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, I I'm slightly less enthused with with the uh, with that than you are, like just like the the body without going off with it. So I gotta stick with my B. But you know, as as we always say, you're free to give whatever grade to it. You can, you can give your B plus. <laughs> yeah, I think we talked about this in OTJ. I just love lifelink. Yeah, lifelink, perhaps my favorite ability because it means I can play more longer Magic games. I'm a, I'm a lifelink fan as well. All right, next up we've got the first card in a cycle here, a, a high profile constructed cycle. See how good it is for limited. Flare of Fortitude. So this is two white white for an instant at rare. You may sacrifice a non-token white creature rather than pay the spell's mana cost. So that's the, the line of text you're going to see in all of these. The effect is, until end of turn, your life total can't change, and permanents you control gain hexproof and indestructible. Yeah, this one not really sold on. No. The four mana version, very clunky protection spell. Yeah. It is nice to, like, if this was cheaper, like, say it was two mana to cast, um, and you just had the incidental upside of, you, you can cast it when you're tapped out sometimes. Like, basically, you know, if they cast a removal spell, you change the target to something smaller. That's that's nice, but I think that this is just too overcosted. You, you're not going to want to sacrifice something very often. Yeah, I, I think this is like a D. Yeah, or sideboard card even. Might just want to give it the sideboard grade for somebody to get for it with a lot of removal. Are you going to board this in against someone with removal? Yeah, maybe not even. <laughs> maybe a sideboard D or sideboard D plus or something. In any case, I don't think we would spend too long on it. You can't sacrifice spawn, right? Like, so nope, non-token. Yeah. You can't make them target your your usual, most likely worst thing. Mm -hmm. You can't sacrifice your germs. It's You have to sacrifice a real thing to do the ultimate cost, and four mana is very expensive on this. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay. Yeah, I'll just give it a D minus. I think then not completely unplayable, but sure. All right, we're going on to blue now. First card is Strix Serenade, single blue mana for a instant at rare counter target artifact, creature, or planeswalker spell. 
Its controller creates a 2 2 blue bird creature token with flying, and this is the inverse of Swan Song for folks that know uh, that card. It's, that's, this counters as the other card types in Magic. Yeah, not a limited card. Nope. Oh. You don't want to give your opponents the 2 2. F restricts yeah. Serenade. Uh, oops. Uh, apparently, Flusterstorm is not actually in the set, so we'll skip this one. Uh, Tamio, Inquisitive Student. So this is the second card in the cycle of uh, Flip Planeswalkers. This is a one mana O3 flyer. And when it attacks, you investigate. And when you draw your third card in a turn, exile Tamio, then return to the battlefield, transformed under her owner's control. The no, it Alex. Uh, yeah, I got it. I got it. It's left. <laughs> the Planeswalker is a two loyalty Planeswalker that has a plus two ability of until your next turn, whenever a creature attacks you or a Planeswalker you control, it gets negative one, negative oh until in the turn. Negative three, return target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. If it's green, add one mana of any color. Negative seven, draw cards equal to half the number of cards in your library, round it up, and you get an emblem with you have no max hand size. Yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll stop interrupting you for that. No, it's, okay. it's, not, it's not that important. No worries. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this card's just like the last one. Uh, I think this card is also excellent. Yes, uh, this is another sort of like Rag Event esque card where your opponent goes, crap, turn one Tamio. Uh oh. And also better than the you know the other ones where it's just like uh, this does keep getting in in the late game. It's just an O three flyer. Yeah, a, a nice a nice thing to modify is if you're just planning on keeping on cracking up clues instead mm -hmm. of drawing actual free cards. And this one, yeah, the, the the fact that it's needs a green permanent really doesn't matter. Nope. Um, or sorry, it's a green card that it returns from the graveyard, right? Basically irrelevant. Yeah. And you're very... just happy to play this in any blue deck as the same grade across any color. Yeah. Yeah. This thing's so hard to kill. Like if if you ever decide to flip this plus two to give things and they're they get minus one, like this thing is not dying. No. Very very good. And it ults, you know, not not that late after you fit if you want to just go for the draw a bunch of cards part of it. Yeah, card's great. You want to give it an A or A minus? It's yeah, those are the options. I agree. <laughs> um, I will go A minus. Yeah, that's what I was leaning as well. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, cool card. Next up, we've got Volatile Storm Drake. This is one in a blue for a 3-2 at rare. It's got flying and hexproof from activated and triggered abilities. Interesting line of text. When it enters the battlefield, exchange control of Volatile Storm Drake and target creature your opponent controls. If you do, you get four energy. Then sacrifice that creature unless you pay an amount of energy equal to its mana value. Ugh. This is one... I'm going to get you to talk about first, because we, we, sure. we could disagree. Okay, so uh, I think this is not great. It's 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 tough because there are some times you're going to like, here's my giant Eldrazi, but then you have to pay a ton of energy. I think giving them a 3-2 is just not very good. I think most of the time what you steal is not going to be as good as this, and paying energy to do so. I guess you get four energy, of course, but... Uh, maybe you like return to your hand after the exchange happens. I I'm gonna I'm starting low on this, but I'm curious if that's not where you're starting. So yeah, what what? Yeah, let's, I, let's get agreed. I might just give this an F. Okay. Yeah. I thought you might. Okay. And I think it's better than that. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear it. So notably, a few things to mention about this. First of all, if you cast it with your opponent having an empty board, you do just get the three two flying. This is true. Right. It's not like uh, Gilded Drake, where mm -hmm. you have to sacrifice it if you don't exchange. That being said, ne or next thing I should say about this is you talked about bouncing it. There are, I believe, at least at common and uncommon, three bounce spells, and then one that I think is a mythic. Mm -hmm. Two of them are creature triggers, so they, they won't actually be able to target this. Because you, you can't... like I think part of the reason it has that hex proof from activated and triggered abilities is so your mana war can't bounce it back to your yeah, hand. Yeah, no funny business. Notably, a downside on this, your opponent's mana wars will work for their own creature. <laughs> right, right. So downside there. However, you do have the MDFC blue bounce spell. Mm -hmm. 
and I think there's a mythic that bounces something and then has whether well, we'll get too soon in blue that, that bounces this. Those play really nicely with this because you give them the Drake and then you bounce it back to your hand. That that preamble aside, we'll, we'll spend a few minutes on this card because I think it's really interesting. Okay. It spots you for energy and gives you equal to mana value, right? So it's asking you to trade this for their four drop. And if you trade this for a four drop, I think it's good. You're basically saying, let, let, let's say the most generic vanilla four drop in the set is like the four, four, uh, adapt two for three mana, right? Yeah. That, that gives things modified, right? The, re the really ugly one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the really ugly one. Yeah. So that one is not, you know, one to write home about. It's not a rare. It's not an uncommon. It's not nothing insane. But you're basically saying your 4-4 um, four, four gets side-graded into a 3-2 flyer, and I'm getting your 4-4 four, four with upside for, for two mana, which I think is pretty good. But then there's also stuff like the 6-6 six, six Trampler for four mana, the, the green thing. I think that's going to be like a defining card in the format, the the um, Wumpus. Yep. And the Chrysalis that grows and becomes huge. And like so many of the four drops, you are very, very happy to take from your opponent. And if you do happen to get like a three drop or whatever, bank the energy or maybe a five or a six drop. I think this is way better than it looks because it only costs two mana. I don't know if I've convinced you at all. I've just talked a lot of words. No, but... no, no. Like you've talked me up a little bit. I guess I the, the part I'm not entirely sold on is that you're you're actively happy about that exchange of like exchanging this for a four drop. Like I I think and I also think like you described there are situations where that can kind of backfire where they they have the bound spell. I, I agree it's not an F. Like, when I like when I even said I want to kind of give it an F, I was going to say right after, like, it it probably isn't actually an F, but for set review purposes, I, I will, after hearing all that and balancing it with my own, own thoughts, I think I'm going to give it, like, a D, but I'm curious to see if you go a little higher. Well, like, okay, so imagine, so some of the rares and mythics we've seen so far today, right? Mm -hmm. The four mana blue-white thing, it's, it's insane to exchange with that. Mm-hmm. Psychic Frog, it's like excellent to exchange with that. The um, the black, green, white of the Reliquary, like it's excellent to exchange with that. Uh, the N Nadu, the three, four rare, like they will draw a card, but you will be able to, like you're super happy to exchange with that. The Titan, th th there's like a lot of really good targets to exchange with. So in that case, you're looking to exchange it with a rare, not just a, a four, four. <laughs> like... <laughs> I'm I'm just saying like the example I gave was with a common. And right, I think right. it's still, I see what you're saying. You're still fine mm -hmm. with, with trading it for a common. And then some of the uncommons I gave were like really good. Some of the rares are insane to exchange with. Yeah, I I'm usually the optimist on grades and I, I like giving uh, you know, giving cards the benefit of the doubt. And I, I absolutely could see being wrong on this, but I'm I'm gonna stick with my lowest grade. Um, okay. What do, what do you want to give it as a, as a final grade? You talk me up to a D plus. I'll stay there. D plus? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna go C, and okay. then we'll we'll uh, we'll stick with our differences there. Yeah. Good to have some disagreements. Good to uh, yeah. get that engagement going. Next up, we've got Amphibian Downpour. This is two in a blue for an aura with flash at rare, and it's got Storm. So for each spell you've or for each spell that has been cast this turn, not just yours, your opponent's too, you make a copy of this, and it enchants creature. It's an aura. The enchanted creature loses all abilities and is a blue frog creature token with base power and toughness 1-1. One, one. Yeah, so Storm will count your opponent's spells. Mm -hmm. So if they play a creature, you can immediately turn that thing into a 1-1 one, one and something else into a 1-1. One, one. Mm -hmm. I think this thing's not bad. Yeah, this is this is okay. I think that's what's going to happen a lot of the time, right? Like, y your opponent plays a 2, passes turns to you, you play your third land, they play another creature, they cast this, turn their 2-2 two, two into a 1-1, one, one, turn their... Uh, three mana card into a one one. Although you know, against like the Watchdog, it's pretty bad. All those things that we've talked about with uh, counters going on creatures. I, I don't love the card. No, I was also gonna give this like maybe even like C minus. Yeah, I was just gonna go D plus. Like it does remind me of Asinine Antics from Wilds of Eldraine, and that card was quite bad. And obviously, it's a different card, a little more expensive, but. I think enough of the time turning their thing, like let's just say they, you know, the 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 good 
side of this is they they cast something that doesn't you know, you turn to a one one it it didn't have an enter the battlefield effect it uh, doesn't have counters on it it just stays a one one and, and they didn't get any more value that's just still not that good it's okay well so notably wilds of eldrain was everything costed one to four mana aside from hamlet glutton right like it was the set was very low to the ground mm -hmm. and this set's about casting giant eldrazi potentially yeah this is true this is true yeah i sorry i think you already said you're great but I'll, I'll give it a c minus if that's what i said okay, so, okay. yeah, yeah. You, you joined me now yeah but... i'll join you c minus there okay. i agree i agree that <laughs> hitting an eldrazi is not bad all right, we've got Dreamtide Whale. This is another cool one. Two and a blue for a 7-5 Vanishing 2 creature at rare. And Vanishing 2 says, this creature enters the battlefield with two time counters. At the beginning of your upkeep, remove a time counter from it. When the last one is removed, you sacrifice it. So it's a giant creature for three mana, but it goes away. But also says, whenever a, creature ca or sorry, whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, proliferate. Yeah, I, cool I like card. the design on these rares. Yeah, really cool card. Really cool card, but also probably like worse than people think. Yeah, I would I would assume that too. It's not that hard to, uh, or sorry, it's not super easy to cheat key double spelling, and you you get one turn of not double spelling before. No, you don't. Right, like you if you cast this on turn three uh -huh. and you don't double spell the next turn, then it's immediately done. Sorry, yes, that. yes, you're you're totally right. Although you know, counts your opponents for what it's worth, but yeah, yeah. you have you have to do it when when you untap with it. Right, so you need to either cast this on a turn where you are cast like this is your first of two spells, so you mm -hmm. double spell the turn you cast this, or yeah, you need to double spell. You need to plan to double spell every turn for the rest of the game, as long as that last one you have a three mana seven five. Right. Also, giant Dumbo creature does get chumped by all drowsy spawns, so that's a slight knock from uh, by it. But you know, as you always say, it's a uh, chump block. Is is not uh, it's not nothing. It's still something. They're giving up their spawn. Well, this is a great target for wing it. Yeah, I just give it flying and uh, get the get the flying, get the flying counter, counter and, and like a two mana trick. Hit them for nine, and then you have a, a seven power flyer next turn. Yeah, I guess not. Not you know proliferating your flying counter doesn't actually do anything, but uh, you can do it if you like to. <laughs> well, it, yeah, that that was the part I. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. <laughs> Cheap spell gives this thing evasion permanently. We there's, just, like, there, there's, some, there's some juice you can do with this. We just flew through the white cards, and now the blue ones are all like, ooh, super interesting. How good is this? So I, I think this ends up being fine. It, it might honestly just balance out to a C, but it could be even worse than that. So I, after just like talking about how bad it is, like proliferating in this set is extremely powerful. It is good. Yeah, it's not it's not just like you're trying to scramble to keep this around. You when you do the thing, you get an actual benefit of you know, putting more counters and stuff, putting giving yourself energy. Yeah. So it's like a build around for you've got cheap cards in your deck which you're looking to do anyways and you have reasons to care about proliferate, which is not that hard. Yeah, like a like a build around B minus. I'll I'll go build around C plus. I I think. No, you know if, if you just have like one counter and you get to keep this around and put a counter on something that is pretty good. All right, I I'll join you. It also helps that blue has a cheap cantrip in uh, the the draw card get to energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'll you join do, you. You do need to be the deck for it, but you're also like we're saying if you get one extra turn, if you get two extra turns. If you get like three attacks in with this, it's probably gotten its value already, right? Like your opponent can't take twenty one, mm -hmm. so they're either trading with it or, or chump blocking it at least once, which means you've already got the cards worth out of it. Okay, what sold me on this card is it has that magic five toughness. That's I think that's that's the thing that uh, really makes me like yeah. the card. Yeah, yeah. So and, you know, one thing I think maybe would to be said better to be said at the beginning of the review, but we'll say I'll say it now here is that. A lot of these cards, I think you need an understanding of how how to make the card work and what qualifies as good enough in my deck. So all of our grades, I think, they might seem a little bit inflated, a little bit high. Actually, in the Discord yesterday, um, a few people were like, oh, the grades for you know the, the commons and uncommons seemed a little bit higher than usual. Not because this is a higher power level set, it, because you know we're grading still relative to all the other cards in the set, but because 
I think there is more room for cards in this set to be good if you build around them the right way. So I'll join you on the B plus, or sorry, B minus for Dreamtried Whale, but that's with the understanding that you do have it in the right deck and are playing the right cards with it. Yeah. Cool. All right. How do you read the next one? Uh, sorry, so you said I am? I yeah, am? yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't catch the no, first that's part. Okay, so oh, it's Flare of Denial, the second in the free spell cycle. One blue, blue for an instant, just like the others. You may sacrifice a non-token blue creature rather than play this spell's mana cost. Counter target spell. Right, so this is a cancel with slight to moderate upside. Uh, the thing is that this is another card that's getting a ton of hype for Constructed, but there's not too much that are, that you just don't mind being like, okay, I'll sacrifice this for a free counter spell. You know, there's zero visionary. People love bone splinters. Like this is <laughs> kind of like better bone splinters. I it mean, is. I'm not one of those people, but yeah. Um, but it it's like a C plus, right? Cancel with like a little yeah. bit of upside. Yeah, yeah, I cool. think C plus is fair for this. Nice. Next up, we've got Harbinger of the Seas. This is one blue, blue for a 2-2 two, two at rare. And we can probably pass on this one. Well, maybe not. We'll see. Non-basic lands are islands. Sideboard Right, first? so that shuts off all of the... Um... The colorless stuff? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's the fetch lands, too, where, like, your mm -hmm. opponent can't fix themselves anymore. But it is a two-mana, hard-to-cast, three-drop. Yeah, so, three-mana, two-two. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, you said you did. You say sideboard. For I this? would bring this in against somebody who had a lot of lands. Yeah, I think it's probably yeah. good enough. Okay. I'll, yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Cool. Next up is Ugin's Binding. This is two and a blue for an instant at Mythic. It's got the void. It says return at target non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. So three mana bound spell. Can't even target your own things. But whenever you cast a colorless spell with mana value seven or greater. You may exile Ugin's Binding from your graveyard. When you do, return each non-land permanent you can you don't control to its owner's hand. Yeah, this is the other bounce spell I talked about with the Drake, um, or the yeah Storm Drake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this thing is a card you'll be happy to include, even if you don't have the Storm Drake. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite nice to bounce all of your opponent's stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right. You do need some. You need that second ability to be yes, relevant. Absolutely. You don't want to pay three mana for a bounce spell. They can't target yeah, your I stuff. Yeah, I don't think we need to. Like, I think that's obvious enough. Again, we won't give it the grade of you mm -hmm. know, synergy or build mm -hmm. or whatever. But as long as you have like two or three hits in your deck that are seven CMC or higher, the card's just great. Like, it's just going to yeah. win the game when that happens. It, and also, like, the fact that it buys you a little bit of time. Like, when you, when you have a bounce spell, you, you don't want to be just like, all right, bounce your thing just because you're actually bouncing them to buy you some time to cast that 7-drop. Yeah. So, yeah, I like the card. Uh, I want to give Ugin's Binding a A-. minus. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Nice. Sweet. Up next is... Ooh, a very interesting card. Shadow of the Second Sun. So this is 4 blue-blue for an enchantment aura at Mythic, and it enchants a player. It's going to be you. At the beginning of Enchanted Player's post-combat main phase, there is an additional beginning phase after this phase terrible wording on this card by the way but the reminder text yeah. says the end step happens after the added untap upkeep and draw step so you're gonna get this at the after your main two basically and right so yeah good go ahead sorry no no i, well, I was, was gonna, gonna say, say that... <laughs> okay what? one no, two no, no. three <laughs> yeah okay I'll, I'll say it here the beginning phase basically you get you get an extra uh un untap upkeep draw and you draw. You basically get a, another draw step and all your mana for the turn. Okay, so you you're always gonna cast this main phase one. Right. Yes. Right. Then you have your combat phase. Then you have your second main phase. Then you have untap upkeep draw and then end step. So you can't actually like you will get to untap all your creatures, all your lands, mm -hmm. get an extra draw step. That's all upside. But you won't be able to spend that mana unless you have an instant way to do it because you won't be able to, like, you basically have your untap, upkeep, draw, then you have your end step, and then on your next turn, you're going to have your untap, upkeep, draw again. So you can only spend the extra mana on instant speed things. Right. I, I didn't take that in the first time I read it, but until, until somebody pointed it out to me. And uh, yeah, it makes the card. I was thinking it was like, uh, basically, you take an extra turn each turn with no combat. And it's right. kind of like that if you've got a bunch of instants. 
Right. I, I think this card's bad if you if you don't have a ton of instants. Yes. I I actually like I, I was talking to somebody this morning about this card and I was like, yeah, it's just like a time walk with you know all that stuff. But no, wait, I, I agree. You need to be building around it to some degree. Or not not building around it, but you need to have five, six, seven, eight ways to use your mana instant speed. Yeah, I think I think you need yeah, like I'm leaning on this card is bad unless you have, you know, the deck for it type of thing. There's also, you know, activated abilities that, that works. There's like the uh, common blue-green Eldrazi that has the tap draw card. Driving more cards. It's not, well, you, yeah, but you don't, like, you don't need to be... Yeah, That's, no, no, I agree. Drawing, drawing cards is not what you want to be doing with your extra mana. No, 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 already no. Get no, no. You know, I'm casting removal or something. So... Sort of a, like a build around card or a synergy card. Let, let's just say yeah. you do get to that number, right? Let's say you get to that seven, eight ways to spend the mana. Card's good, but not great still. Yeah, I kind of want to give it another build around B minus. Yeah, yeah. I'm on board with you with that. And this is definitely one that's like <laughs> the conversation. It, it's not even, it's tricky as a, as a grader because usually i put faith in like most people reading the my tier list or whatever being like yeah i understand where what you'd want this card to you know what would uh, make this card work but it's not even clear what the card does for the first time you read it honestly so yeah be, yeah. be careful everybody listening you have a leg up versus everybody else who's going to cast this for the first time and be like oh wait that's how this card works so yeah. yeah and i do think that for people who do use you know 17 lands and check the stats often like almost all the things that we give synergy or build around grades to, I think we'll end up with, with bad stats. Agree. Totally. Okay. That's black. So black here, we've got nether goif, single black mana for a mythic star plus one star. So just like Tarmogoyf. Nether goif's power is equal to the number of card types among cards in your graveyard. And it's toughness is equal to that number plus one. That's what the the uh, stat box is telling you. It also has escape for two and a black. The uh, additional escape cost is exile any number of other cards from your graveyard with four or more card types among them. Yeah, so it only counts your graveyard instead yes. of both. Uh, but it is a cheap, big creature. Like this is, I think this card's good. Yeah, I do too. Um, you don't have to be, you know, you're not you're not going to grow this to like construct the levels of a, a six seven by turn three or whatever. But uh, it's it's going to get reasonably... Like it's, it's a one-drop that's going to have two power pretty reasonably in the mid-game and then grow from there. And then you can... You know, escaping it, it's going to be something you probably only do once. But, you know, getting back a trump blocker or a small creature, something that gangs up in a double block, totally fine. Yeah, you'll, you'll often escape it as, like, a zero-one. Right, yeah, that is true. Or, or, or like, or like a, you know, a one-two. One, like, two. it'll be tiny. It'll be tiny. But, yeah, I do think, like... Creatures and lands in this set will both be easy to get. Some number of instants and sorceries, you probably have one of those spotted. And then your deck's probably going to have either artifacts or enchantments. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that in the mid to late game, this is like a 4-5 or a 5-6. Yeah, and there's self-mill. Some self-mill in this set. There's some ways to discard. So, yeah, I think this card is fine. Um, it's it's kind of Tarmogoyfy, where it's just like, just not going to be an over-the-top rare, but... It, it's going to be overrated by some people, underrated by others. Let's put it that way. So well, We've talked about this before, but the bar for one mana cards mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. not that high. Like, if, if your one mana card is decent, it's probably a good card. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think this kid gets, like, a C+. Plus. I, was, I wrote down B- for okay. myself. Yeah, not too far away. Yeah, yeah we're not okay. advocating this as, like, some busted rare, but it's, like, a you know, level of a good common or something. All right, next up is Chthonian Nightmare. This is one in a black for an enchantment at rare. When it ETBs, you get three energy. It says you can pay X energy, sacrifice a creature, return Chthonian Nightmare to its owner's hand, return target creature card with mana value X from your graveyard to the battlefield, activate only as a sorcery. So a recurring nightmare callback here. Yeah, I, I think this is the only black card that produces or uses yep, energy. I believe so you're more likely to like splash this in another deck, I think, mm -hmm. than actually play it in, you know, a black red energy deck or whatever. I, I imagine you can. Well, yeah, well, hold up. Yeah. Let's think about that. Yeah. Because I think this card's good. I do too. Yeah. And if you have no other sources of energy, I still think it might be playable. 
just for like you you reanimate cheap things and maybe you reanimate like a two at some point and then you save up an energy can reanimate a four the next time you cast it so recurring nightmare was um obviously it's like reanimation and people think oh i'm gonna sack my tiny thing and i'm gonna make a huge thing that's not what it did but right well, it, it did. Like, that was great. But part of the thing that made it so annoying to play against was it could be an engine. Right. Right? If you have one creature with an ETB and one just normal dopey creature even, mm -hmm. let alone potentially to have two creatures with ETBs, you could, with Recurring Nightmare, you could pay six mana, you could just cycle through and do your, your ETB, whatever, your Necrotal or whatever it is, and kill your creature. Mm -hmm. And there's still a lot of cheap... ETBs potentially with this or things that have die triggers. So I think you're looking for cheap cards with enter the battlefield effects or leave the battlefield effects. But if you get that, that like this card can be really strong, especially for only two mana now. Yeah, it's a nice there was that the reform card in blue from yesterday, the uncommon. Like it's a good thing to sacrifice to this. Huh. Sorry, what was that? Oh, I'm saying reform. The the oh one that dies into a three three dies into a six six dies into a, a nine nine. Like that's a nice little. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I thought you said reform. That oh no, like, no, 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 no. Reef, reform. reform. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So this is a card that like it's once again another card that you're not just gonna throw in your deck. I think you need to have some number of the things you listed. But it is good. Like it's 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 a card that is finicky going to play better in the hands of players that kind of can form a game plan around it and know when to use this, when to cast it, when to, when to sacrifice what to it. So it's, it's card's got a lot of play on it, uh, to it. High skill ceiling, I would say. Yeah, because, there's, there's, I mean, I, I'm just thinking more about this card. Uh, there, we did talk yesterday about there's a black deck that has, like, the sacrifice mm -hmm. sub-theme, where obviously this is going to be very good. But even if... Let's say you have time and the game installed, which doesn't happen as often in 2024 as it did, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But you can also use this to build up energy, right? Like if you have the um, the one drop that you can bring back from your graveyard for four mana, you can even just bring that back with this and keep banking two energy every time you do it. Right. And then get something big after a couple of... Yep. Uh, cycles of this yeah and, and chat just to like you know we've been talking a lot of words about this card some some people are saying are they considering other energy sources or is it good just by itself both basically right a lot of what we just talked about was like just considering it without other energy sources not splashing this in an energy deck but of course you're going to do that sometimes too yeah like, well, yeah we're talking about this with with no energy uh synergy yeah you do, you do need the etb signature sy uh, synergy for that side of things but i also think like almost any energy deck i think you just splash this yeah i agree like this is the engine -y card that an energy deck would really really like especially because when you sacrifice an energy creature or reanimate an energy creature like just fuels it more you can get bigger things yeah it's this is a really really cool card there's so much play to it i i think we're gonna the grade is going to be uh mostly academic here <laughs> i mean it's good to frame it but i think it's going to be a card that will play pretty differently in a lot of decks because sometimes you are just the looping some value creatures, cheap value creatures. Sometimes you are using it as an engine to get more energy. Sometimes you are building up to reanimating a big thing. There's like the the worm coil uh, uncommon, the, like sacking that's pretty good to reanimate and make two tokens from that. So gonna gonna be one of the cooler rares I think in the set. Yeah, the is it common too? Like the, oh yeah. The pay three energy deal damage equal to its power yeah i'm really excited about this one now, actually so power level let's just give it a power level grade like when you get this going with all the stuff we just talked about how good do you think it is i think it's like a b mm -hmm. that's i'm glad yeah that's exactly what i was gonna say too but again okay. this is I'll a to talk about it for a b but yeah, yeah. conversation <laughs> above grade on this one for sure but yeah very sweet yeah. card Next up is a, well, I think a bit of a simpler card here, Emperor of Bones. It's a 1 and a black 2-2 two, two at rare. At the beginning of combat on your turn, exile up to one target card from a graveyard, and it's got Adapt 2 for 1 and a black. Whenever one or more plus 1 plus 1 counters are put on Emperor of Bones, put a creature card exiled with Emperor of Bones onto the battlefield under your control with a finality counter. It gains haste. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. And for those who don't remember, finality counter just means when this goes away it's it gets exiled gone for good 
And you can do that on your opponent's turn. Sure can. Yeah, steal something, block with it. Also, you get a modified creature, which is kind of funny. <laughs> There's even, like, yeah, some creatures that you can get back that will allow you to put counters onto this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A couple, probably. There's definitely some black-green things, so you can kind of, like, keep chaining it. Yeah. Yeah, really sweet card. Cool card, yeah. I think you're happy to play it on two, and even happier to play it on four. Yeah. Yeah, I want to give this a... I think closer to a B plus than an A minus, but I can see it getting there. Like, yeah, B plus if you're not in the green black, like cheap ways of putting counters on it. Mm -hmm. But I, I, as soon as you have like that snakeskin veil card or whatever, or even just the green one that's the common, that's not the, the land, um, you, you can just go ham with this thing. Yeah. And like, you know, nothing to say if this is just like attacking for four on turn three, if that's what you want to do with it. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll, I'll go to B plus. Unisys also join me or A minus. Yeah, I'll join. Okay. Cool. Next up, you got Ripples of Undeath. One in a black for an enchantment at rare. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, mill three cards. Then you put may pay one and three life. If you do, put a card from among those cards into your hand. There's literally games I would choose to give my opponent this yes, in play. Yes. This is like, this, this is pretty card bad. Is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. This is an all right. Yeah. Great. Quick F here. Next okay. up, we've got Sorin, which is the uh, Flip Planeswalker for black. Sorin of House Margov. One in a black for a 1-4 lifelink. And it's got Extort, which says whenever you cast the spell, you can pay Orzhov Hybrid, so either white or black. If you do, each opponent loses one life and you gain that much life. It's only a one-time thing. You can't just, like, fireball them. It's just one per spell. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, if you gain three or more life this turn... Exile Sorin, then return to the battlefield transformed as, as Sorin Ravenous Neonate. Three loyalty planeswalker with extort still. Plus two, create a food token. Negative one, Sorin deals damage equal to the uh, amount of life you've gained this turn to any target. Negative six, gain control of target creature. It becomes a vampire in addition to its other types. Put a lifelink counter on it if you control a white permanent other than Sorin. Yeah, so it doesn't really care about the white permanent. Mm -hmm. uh, this card... I, I love it. It's great. I love it. <laughs> it's a very marked oh, life card. Hit <laughs> me up. Life like. Yeah. Extort. You, you must have loved Orzov back in the day. Like that just seems like oh, your kind I of did. day. I did. Yeah. I, I in the in the in the Gate Crash PT, which the the limited format wasn't great, but I drafted Orzov and uh beat Jesse Hampton on a mulligan to four in my first match. Nice. So, yeah. Also, I might have said pre-combat main phase. I think I did. It's post-combat main phase is when it checks if you've gained three life. Yes. Which makes all that yeah, more so sense. You, which, means, which makes sense because you can attack with it, get mm -hmm. the one life from lifelink, or potentially even more if you've got, you know, counters on this, right? Like, it holds counters nicely, even though you don't get to keep them when you flip the walker. And then the backside, you can immediately minus one to deal something at least three damage. Plus two make a food token. Where have we seen that ability before? <laughs> That's a lot of loyalty. Just having extort, like, yeah. on the back side. This thing's sweet. So, so cool. I, I love this card's going in my cube for sure. So you either want cheap spells to flip it, or you want uh, some amount of life gain. That's really not that hard. Uh, Soren can probably attack and spot you a point because it's a one four. Maybe you uh, pump the Soren somehow. I think it's very. It's going to be quite easy to flip Soren. Like if you have a, a a trick or just something that pumps power, you extort your thing that pumps power, and then Soren gets in, and that's your three right there. Even if you don't flip this, like if if it was just the yeah. front side, I I would still like. This yeah, card. it would be good. All right, what are you gonna give it? I'll let you do the first grade here. I somewhere between A minus and A mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. probably gets an A minus. Yes, I, I think so too. I, I was wondering if you're gonna go a little bit higher than that. <laughs> but yeah. I will pass it as if it's an A plus though. A plus in Mark's <laughs> heart. Alright, cool. Next up we've got War and Soul Trader, this is a card you mentioned once or twice yesterday. It's a two and a black for a three three rare. Pay a life, sacrifice a creature, create a treasure token. It's not a tap ability, just do that anytime. Yeah, that unbound, you know, no mana, no once per turn, sacrifice another creature mm -hmm. to do a thing. Like, there's going to be some combos with this, I'm I'm yes. sure, in, in Constructed of some kind, whether they're good enough or not, 
to be determined. And limited, it's not going to come up that often, but it's still relevant text. For sure. Yeah, it's a free Zach outlet, which matters. There are a few little combos, I think, in limited. Um, this is, you know, this is where the um, we kind of reached our limit as set reviewers, not going to be able to deep dive on all the sick combos you can do with this card. But there is some stuff here and there that I think even Unlimited comes up. Yeah, we talked about a lot of the blue-black stuff yesterday, mm -hmm. like the black base with a splash of blue. I think this is the perfect card for it. Yeah. So it's going to range from like a fine card, 3-mana three 3-3 three, with a little bit of upside, to a card that interacts nicely with some of your other cards. I think I'd give a word in Soul Trader a B plus. Oh, sorry, his C plus. Yeah, I, I I had written C plus for myself, and then I started to raise my eyebrows when you said B. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Necro Dominance. So this is a callback to Necropotence. Black, black, black for a legendary enchantment. Interesting, that's legendary. Skip your draw step. At the beginning of your end step, you may pay any amount of life. If you do, draw that many cards. Your max hand size is hand size is five. If a card or token would be put into your graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So we had Necropotence in Wilds, Wilds of Eldraine, and that was a niche playable card. How do you feel about Necrodominance? Pretty similar. Mm -hmm. I also think it's niche playable. It does play nicely with a few cards. Like there's that one three common death toucher that if you've drawn three cards, you can drain for free. Yeah, that's cool. That plays really nicely with this. Get to draw them, no, no downside, basically. Yeah, yeah, you get you get the free drain, and you get you know basically two extra cards out of it. Uh, it is extremely hard to cast. I think this is like a, a D. Yeah, it's it's like if you're wondering where it's niche playable, you, you have to be reasonably heavy black. You don't have to be close to mono black because you can just cast on turn six, and it's still okay as your draw spell refill. But you want. Removal spells, you want cheap cards, you want you know, any, anything you can imagine a control deck would kind of want. It's also really nice with the, like, Corrupt, right? Like, Oh yeah, for sure. If you're playing almost mono black and mm -hmm. you can have a two mana card that gains you, like, six, seven, eight life. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a deck there for yeah. this. I think D is a pretty appropriate grade, though. It'll come up yeah. once in a while. Yep. All right, we've got the Black Flare here. Flare of Malice. This is two blue-blue for an instant at rare. You can sacrifice a non-token black card rather than this pay the spell's mana cost, and each opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker with the greatest mana value among creatures or planeswalkers they control. Okay, it's a good effect. Yeah, this um, I, I like this one, and this is yeah. again, it goes in that pack. Like it plays really well with the the one one artifact that you bring back. It also plays well with the the flesh bag marauder because you can play the the flesh bag. Again, kind of with the other thing, sack it with the ability on the stack, get two of their creatures out of this. Yeah. Um, I think this card's solid. Yeah, by far, this is the one you're going to be paying the alternative costs uh, most often compared to the other ones, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, and sack, sack your creatures in response to removal, too. Like, yep. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you haven't played with that effect before, because it doesn't come up too often, um, it plays out a little bit better than you might think. Much, much better than just, like, they sacrifice a creature. Hmm. So I think I would give Flare of Malice a C plus. Maybe I, I'm going to go B minus, okay. and I do think it gets up to like a B if you have the the parts for it. I think yep. I think it's good. All right, yeah, yeah. I'll still give my C plus. Okay. Uh ooh, <laughs> Shilgengar. I'm gonna go with Shilgengar. Shilgengar, Sire of Famine. Three black black for a legendary creature at rare. It's a six six flyer. It says sacrifice another creature. Then create a blood token. If you sacrifice an angel this way, create a number of blood tokens equal to its toughness instead. Orzov hybrid, Orzov hybrid, Orzov hybrid. So three mana. Uh, any combo of black and white. Sacrifice six blood tokens. Return each creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a finality counter on it. Those creatures are vampires in addition to their other types. A very cool card. Mm -hmm. I don't think that last ability... Like, you've got a 6-6 six, six flyer. If it lasts for long enough... <laughs> yeah. The game's probably already over. But already, like, 6-6 six, six flyer for 5 with upside is, is a good card. Pretty good. Yeah. You're going to cash in, like, I think when you play it, like, let's say they go to kill this. um, You're probably going to sack something dorky to make a blood once in a while. Yeah, it's still just yeah, a big dummy for the most part, though. Like, I, I don't think have... it's anything special. If you have this in play and they've got red removal that they've got to point at other mm -hmm. stuff, then... Turn that stuff That's into blood. True. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I still am not going to be that high on the card. I, I think I'd give Shulgengar a, a C plus. C plus? I was going to give it a B. I think like really? six. Fire it is large. Is... Yeah, it kills them quickly if they can't kill it. Yeah, I'll come. I'll come up to B minus. I agree. They like six six okay. is large, but yeah, kind of just I don't know. I, a little, a little bit underwhelmed by it. That's all. All right, Crabomination up next. Four black black for a rare. It's a 5-5, five, five, and it has Emerge from Artifact. So you have to sacrifice an artifact rather than a creature. And the Emerge from Artifact cost is 5 black black. So an additional mana compared to its mana cost. When Crabomination enters the battlefield, the target opponent exiles the top card of their library, a card at random from their graveyard, and a card at random from their hand. They may cast a spell from among the cards exiled this way without paying its mana cost. Cool. Yeah, that Emerge won't come up often. No. Like You're almost never going to do it unless you've got some affinity thing that you've mm -hmm. snuck into play uh, and even then you probably just want to keep it and just wait till you've got six mana for this thing but i think this thing's really good yeah very strong yeah just get the <laughs> i don't know if anybody's played with grenzo in the, the latest uh ch chromatic cube but it runs a little bit of that card just uh, a big body that gets you a spell most of the time and i yeah i, I think this card is just good um yeah, there, there is a chance that you hit three lands and don't do anything. It's true, it's true. But if you just hit, like, one thing... Yeah, like, even if you got two a drop. It's like, a three for one, right? right? If you hit a single spell, it's a three for one. Yes, yes, exactly. It is, is automatically a two for one with the card from hand. And you're, even if you hit, like, a two drop, you're pretty happy. Yeah, I think this yeah. card's really good. I, I would give Crab Abomination an A-. minus. Okay, I w I'm going to give it a straight A. I okay. Think it's, I think it's good. Yeah. yeah, sweet. Okay, that's going to bring us on to red with Party Thrasher. It's one in a red for a 1-4 at rare. Non-creature spells you cast from Exile have Convoke. <laughs> okay. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you can discard a card. If you do, exile the top three cards of your library. Choose one of them. You can play them this turn. So you basically get to cast Tormenting Voice each turn. Yeah, on a 1-4 for two mana. Yeah, that's okay. I like, I like it. Yeah, totally fine. Uh, you want to give us like a C plus? Uh, I want to give it a, a B minus. Okay. I, I like this thing. Okay. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny. I, I'm a little bit lower on the rares than you are, it seems. But yeah, I'll, I'll stick with my C plus. I'm falling for the classic set reviewer trap where you're influenced by the, the color of the, the symbol on the, the right side. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Power balance is up next. Red, red for a rare enchantment. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you can reveal the top card of your library. If you do, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost if the two spells have the same mana value. It's not a limited card. No, I think we're just going to give this an F. Cool yeah. card, though. <laughs> uh, we've got the Red Planeswalker in the cycle here, Ral Monsoon Mage. One or red for a 1 3. Instant sorceries, uh, instant sorcery spells you cast cost one less. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery during your turn, if uh, flip a coin. If you lose the flip, Ral deals one damage to you. If you win the flip, you can transform Ral. Ral transforms into a two loyalty planeswalker with the static ability when it enters the battlefield, or I guess it enters the battlefield effect. When it enters the battlefield, uh, oh, sorry, it does enter the battlefield with an additional loyal counter on him if, uh, let me try this again. Ral enters the battlefield with an additional loyalty counter on him for each instant and sorcery spell you've cast this turn. So kind of a storm rip. Plus one, until end of turn, instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. Negative two. Ral deals two damage divided uh, as you choose among one or two targets. You then draw a card if you control a blue permanent other than Ral. Negative eight. Exile the top eight cards of your library. You may cast instant and sorcery spells from among them without paying their mana costs this turn. The plus one is actually until your next turn. Ah, so I read it even more wrong. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so a lot of words in this one. Let's just go step by step here, because uh, I couldn't follow along with it clearly reading it. So I'm sure people at home will have even a tougher time. So the front side is a two mana one three that it's almost like a brawl. If you're familiar with brawl, it makes your spells cost less. Not that exciting. No, not that exciting. And when you flip it, uh, it it's going to come in with at least three loyalty, because you have to cast a spell to do that, and it makes your spells cheaper. Yeah, just. This is, I think, the worst of the bunch we've seen so far. Yeah, they they set the bar really high with the other three. The mm -hmm. green one's kind of medium, but this one I think is like not great. Yeah, I, I think you do want to be red 
blue for this so I that you can so when you flip it you get the card like i think that's an important piece of making this card good right that's kind of like the the hoops you're trying to jump through amount to that like you want to kill something draw a card throughout and then be left with a, a planeswalker yeah so yeah it's not not really great um you also just have to have like a decent density of spells because like you know let's just if you're unlucky and you have to flip three four times before it actually flips and it deals the damage to you in the process yeah I, and you need like you need spells and blue permanents I right think, like yeah i think this is one to not get tripped up by the rarity symbol here i i think ral's probably just like a d a d i think it's that bad like a d plus i'll go a little higher say d plus but in the d range is kind of what i was thinking okay i was gonna give it a c minus okay and I'm assuming you're red blue sure yeah yeah that's fair yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, next up we've got Detectives Phoenix. This is two and a red for an enchantment creature at rare. It's a 2-2 two -two flying haste, and it's got an interesting uh, cost here. Bestow for a single red mana, which, again, uh, you can play this as an aura, and when the creature it's enchanted dies, this will fall off into a creature. But you also have to collect evidence six, <laughs> which, if you didn't play MKM, that means exile cards from your graveyard with six mana value um, or more. It has flying in haste. The enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two, and has flying in haste. And you can cast Detect the Phoenix from your graveyard using its bestow cost. So you actually, yeah, sorry, you, you can do it from your hand as well, but you have the ability to do it from the grave. So it's a 2 2 flying haste, just to recap this all because a lot of words. 2 2 flying haste for three. That's pretty good. Uh, you can bestow it. Very good. But you have to collect the evidence six, and you can also do that ability from your grave. Thing is, banana. Yes, very, very strong like it's either an a or an a plus there's a card i feel like was kind of similar to, oh it's the from mk i'm the the phoenix it was very very similar as you had to collect evidence for when it died and you could bring it back but this is better <laughs> that card was good yeah this is, just, yeah this is just better yeah there's no other thing that is exiling your graveyard on this side either like mm -hmm. this yeah yeah, this card's nice. Give eight. Like, you can just turn anything into a dragon, and then your thing dies, and you have a phoenix, and then your phoenix dies, and you just turn the next thing into a dragon. Like, I am slightly hesitant to give it the A+, plus, but I do want to. All right, I I'll, I'll be the brave one today. Yeah, well, you'll be brave? I've been high on grades for these rares. I'll stay consistent. All right, yeah. Uh, I'll, uh... Am I going to stay the course in my slightly lower grades than you? Nah, screw it. I'll, get, I'll give it the A+, too. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'll yeah, go. yeah. I'll join you. All right, we've got Eldrazi Linebreaker up next. A uh, football fan, it seems. This is one colorless red. Sort of interesting mana cost for a 3-3 Devoid creature at rare. It's got Trample. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, target creature you control gains haste and gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is the number of Eldrazi you control. Ooh. Yeah, so we had the the link breaker last set, and then it's a linebacker for football, isn't it? Oh so think, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess I I don't know my my sports my sports ball words very well. I guess. <laughs> okay, we're, your target audience is is magic players. No, you, you'd but. be surprised. There's a lot of people in chat being like, uh, "Alex, what are you talking about?" <laughs> cool card. Yeah, kind of like a great card, but uh, kind of hard to cast. Yeah, it's effectively a gold card. A strong one, though. Yes, I think still very good. Yeah, it has... Uh, like, obviously, it, it plays really well with Eldrazi spawns, because you're going wide with Eldrazi. Yeah, and I mean, even if you don't have spawns, if you can cast this, it's 4-3 Trample Haste. Yeah. That can give your next thing haste the next turn and pump it. It's, it's very, very good. Yeah, you're often just going to get in for, like, one clean hit with this, I would say. Um, at very least. And you're happy yeah, with you that. don't even need to put this into combat, right? Like, No, 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 you don't. I'm just saying with no other things on board, like, this is going to get a point in. Or, or sorry, a hit in, you're going to be pretty happy about that. Yeah. Assuming this is um, castable, like, you have the color sources, I think this is, like, an A-. minus. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah, really good card. Slayer of Duplication is the red card in the cycle. One red red for an instant rare. You can sack a non-token red creature rather than play this card's mana cost. Copy an instant or sorcery. You may choose new targets for the copy. So uh, you copy anybody. It's yours or the opponent's. Yeah.
don't hate this. Mm -hmm. It's a good it's effect better. to have the a free mode on. It's yeah, but, I mean it is still very awkward. I still don't think it's very good. Yeah, I just no, don't hate it. No, that, no, that I, was, I agree. I think it's like like a to give the grade nice and early for this one. I think it's like a D plus. Yep, I think so too. Okay, because I mean the ideal thing is they target your red creature with a removal spell. You sack it. You copy the removal spell. Mm -hmm. But even that, like, which isn't that unlikely of a scenario. But even that scenario, you need the removal spell they're targeting to match up with the the board state where like it has to deal the right damage to something you want, or there has to be something you want to kill. Mm -hmm. Another pretty yeah. nice thing, nice thing with the uh, the cyclops, the is it cyclops a common? Sack something, deal damage equal to its power. It'll be sure. three. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll come up here and there. It's a, it's a playable card, but uh, will it be three? Will it not? Wait, wait, what? <laughs> you sacrifice it as part of the. Oh cost. yes, you're right. Oh, sorry, I thought you said free. You will be three. No, you're right. It won't, it won't oh, trigger three. prowess. Yeah, yeah. It'll be two. Yeah, it'll be two damage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Keep it in your back pocket. It's a card that might might have some uses, but we've got Wheel of Potential up next. Two in a red for a sorcery or rare. You get three energy, then you may pay X energy. Each player may exile their hand and draw X cards. If X is seven or more, you may play cards you own exiled this way until end of turn. And end of your next, next turn. turn. End of your next turn. Thank you. Yeah. No. But like, is it an F no? No, I think it's not an F no, but it's a uh, mostly like a an D no. Is that fair? Like a, a very D -no? strong proceed with caution D no, <laughs> right? Like yeah, you need a super low curve. Each player right? like may you have a low enough curve, and you're yeah. just doing this for like both players, or I guess discard your hand, draw three cards. And your opponent can also do the same thing. And I think it's I think I think it's mostly just an F, actually. Like I, the more yeah, I think about I'll, it, I think I'll it's... go down to B minus. Okay, I'll I'll give it the F. Okay. Ether Revolt. Roll credits. This is two red red for an enchantment at rare. It's got revolt, which means as long as another permanent you control left the battlefield this turn, you do something. And the thing is, if a source you control would deal non combat damage to opponent or permanent that opponent controls, it deals that much damage plus two instead. Whenever you get one or more energy, either revolt deals that much damage to any target. Yeah, super cool build around. Yeah. Huh. I think it's pretty good. Yeah, spell it out here for me, because I, I haven't gone too deep on this card, but... Well, so, ignoring the revolt ability, mm -hmm. uh, any th card that gives you two or three energy from this point on is dealing two to three damage to any target. Right? Mm -hmm. And then Revolt, which is triggerable with we have fetch lanes, fetch we've lands. got combat, yeah. we've got you know other ways to do it. You're doing two extra damage for non combat damage, which includes not only this thing, but also any burn spell, including the you know, sacrifice blue red uncommon. Um, even the um, the red artifact we saw yesterday, the two three with unearth that deals mm -hmm. the impact tremors. Yeah, it's pretty well supported. This like the there's a lot of little things in the set that deal non combat damage, or sometimes that wouldn't be very relevant. Yeah. Yeah, the blue cantrip turns into a shock draw card. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is legit build around, and I th I think like you said, a very good one. Mm hmm. Build around. Like a like a build around B plus. Yeah, yeah. I think build around B plus. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Awesome card. All right, so we've got Ashling Flame Dancer up next. Two red red for a 4-4 Mythic, Legendary Creature. You don't lose unspent red mana as steps and phases end. It's got Magecraft, which is whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery, uh, you discard a card, then draw a card. If this is the second time this ability has resolved this turn, Ashling deals two damage to each opponent and each creature they control. If it's the third time, add red, 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 red for red mana. So notably, each time, including the second and third time, you still get the rummage. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's a, it's a yep. mandatory one, though. That's interesting. Right? It's not you may. It's just you, you discard a card, then draw a card. But it's also not if you do. So if you have an empty hand, you you're get getting to draw a card. card. Yep. 
Yeah. No. Yeah, so cast two spells, pyroclasm them, deal them some damage. There are a yeah. lot of rares that, like, there were many, many uh, commons that really pointed to, like, a blue-red spells deck, but there's been quite a few rares that have pointed mm -hmm. that way. So that's interesting. Yeah, kind of, kind of a cool card. Mostly a 4-4 four, four for 4, though. Yeah, I think so, too. I wonder if you cast your copy. Yeah, it's not too much copying. Yeah, there's the flare of whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's it's solid. I I think like, yeah. I wonder if there is some sort of niche blue red deck that comes together with some rares that people don't want as much. Yeah, I want to give this like a C minus. I was just gonna give it a C. C. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was between C and C minus. So. Okay, Fair green enough. now, and we're starting with. The uh, Green Planeswalker, Grist, Voracious Larva. It's a single green mana for a 1-2 death touch. Whenever Grist or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it entered from your graveyard or you cast it from your graveyard, you can pay green to transform Grist. Grist turns into a 3 loyalty Planeswalker with a plus 1 ability that creates a 1-1 one, one black and green insect creature token. Then you mill 2 cards. Put a death touch counter on the token if a black card was milled this way. Negative 2 to destroy target artifact or enchantment. Negative six for each creature card in your graveyard. Create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a one-one black and green insect. Yeah, a lot of words for a one-two death. Touch. Yeah, basically. So, what are the ways to actually trigger this? Uh, Cthonia Nightmare, I suppose, is uh, is something with another rare or any reanimation spell, of course. Yeah, victimize or victimize is it called? Yeah, victimize the second oh, thing. Re reanimate two things. Uh, escape, that triggers this. Oh, yeah, if you're playing your red-white. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess there's also the, necro the Necrogoyf. Yeah, there's Necrogoyf, this. too. Yeah. Uh, is there any other? It's mostly just a 1-2 Death Touch for one mana, which, honestly, I'm, like, fine with mm -hmm. in a set with a bunch of Eldrazi. Yeah. Yeah, there's also the, the black creature that brings itself back from the graveyard and paying four mana. Persist. Oh, Persist. Yeah, that's there's, that's true. There's some stuff. I, I think... There are a few things littered throughout the set that will trigger Grist. And Grist is a pretty good Planeswalker. Just plus one, make a 1-1. One, one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Death Touch 1-1. One, one. So I'm going to give this a C on the assumption that I'm never triggering that ability. If you have a deck that can do it more often, it's probably a little bit higher than that, though. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I would just give this, an uh, on average, C+. Plus because I, I think when you have Grist, you're going to look for a few ways to trigger it. Sure. Cool. We've got Fanatic Vronis up next. This is a 2-mana, 1-1 a green, 1-4 at rare. Tap stat green. If you have Ferocious, which means you control a power for, uh, creature power 4 or greater, you instead add green, 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 green. It also has Eternalize, which is... Uh, and the Eternalize cost is 2 green, green. And Eternalize says, exile this card from your graveyard. Create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a 4-4 four, four black zombie token with no mana cost. And you can only Eternalize as a sorcery. So you get to... Flash this back essentially as a four four, and it it has it fulfills its own requirements. It'll tap for four green mana. And unfortunately, it doesn't trigger Grist, right? Because it's not cast from yes, the graveyard or that's true. from the graveyard. You're just making yeah. a token. Yeah. Good, good mana. Uh, card's great. Yeah. Really good. Really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. Blocks really well. Can ramp you into Eldrazi's. I think. I think like there's gonna be some nasty curves where you just go like. Cast this into a four power Eldrazi into like a seven drop Eldrazi. Yeah, that's nice. And yeah, this this is a really good mana dork. Is this like an? It's at least an A minus. I don't think it's quite no. an A. It's probably an A. -minus. I was just gonna give it an A minus, but yeah, Fanatic Ronus okay. is great. Yeah. Springheart Nantuko. Sort of a confusing card here, so let's try to parse it. So this is one in a green for a 1-1. One, one. It's an enchantment creature at rare, which of course means it has bestow. The bestow cost is one in a green. The enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one. It's also got a landfall ability. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you can pay one in a green. If Springheart Nantuko is attached to a creature you control... Oh, sorry. Yeah, you pay one in a green... Yeah. It, 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 that's the end of the sentence. You pay one of a green if, if this is bestowed, if it's an aura. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that creature. If you didn't create a token this way, create a 1-1 one, one green insect token instead. Right. So if it's not bestowed, you're getting a 1-1 one, one green insect. 
if it is bestowed, you have the choice yes. to either get a 1-1 one, one insect or copy the creature. Yes, exactly. Very good. Very good, though. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not, you know what? Maybe these rares are better than I thought. Yeah, I, I, I was, just, I was going to say, once we got to the end of the colors, I was going to say, you know, Mark? I think we have to rescind our earlier statement about the rares not being that good because there are a lot of good rares actually, which I'm I'm actually happy about. I yeah. thought like oh you can open a bunch of packs and you know it won't really matter, but I, I think you are gonna care about that that card on the far left of the pack. I think so too. So what about this card? Do you care about this card? I think so. I think it's really good. Yeah, I think this card's great. Yeah. I think this might be an A. Yep. I, I was going to give it an A minus because it's, it's a little okay. like you bestow it on two or three, probably on four. Um, so you can like do that, uh, play a land, make the ability, do the ability right away. It's kind of what you want to do, I would assume. Like you can just bestow this onto something for plus one plus one. Mm -hmm. And like, that's your turn. If they kill your creature, you're untapping with like a one, one like that. Just making a one, one with landfall is, is still a good yeah, ability. Still good. Yeah, and then you like this is this is a must kill when you bestow it, and then a must kill again once it's fallen. Yeah, off. it forces yeah it forces your opponent to have like two removal. No, you spells. know what? I'll, I'll join it. A. I think anytime you you say must kill and it's cheap and it's not that hard to do the thing, like what else are you looking for, right? I also think you're fine just casting this on turn two, right? Like sure, yeah. If you don't have a two drop, I would do that. Yeah. Cool. All right, A for Springheart and Tuco. Okay. Birthing Ritual is up next. This is a 1 in a green enchantment at Mythic. At the beginning of your end step, if you control a creature, look at the top 7 cards of your library, then you may sacrifice a creature. If you do, you may put a creature with mana value X or less from among those creatures onto the battlefield, where X is 1 plus the sacrifice creature's mana value. Put the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order. I think this is not a limited card. No, I agree. I would just give this an F. Okay. With the slight caveat that like it makes some percentage of decks, but probably not something you need to think about. Flare of Cultivation. This is one green green for a sorcery or rare. Uh, you can sacrifice a green non-token to pay this card's mana cost. Search your library for two basic lands. Reveal those. Put one of them as a battlefield tap. The other one into your hand and shuffle. So you're casting Cultivate here. So it's a hard to cast Cultivate. One green green instead of two in a green. But you can cast it for free, which is something you're probably not going to do very often. No, and... The cultivate doesn't even like unless you got the snow covered wastes, you can't get the colorless mana with this. Right, yeah. Oh, eh. so it doesn't even like necessarily fix you for the color that you're missing. Yeah, hard to cast cultivate. I mean, cultivate wouldn't be that exciting. It'd be fine. Cultivate's fine. Yeah, this thing's like there's a lot of reasons to ramp in this set. Sure. I think it's like a D plus. Yeah, I give cult flare cultivation D plus. Okay. Six is the next card. Just six, as in. Red in six. So this is two and a green for a legendary creature at rare. It's a two four reach. When six attacks, you mill three cards. You may put a land card from among them into your hand. And as long as it's your turn, non land cards or non land permanent cards in your graveyard have retrace, which means you may cast this permanent from your graveyard by discarding a land in, additional to, in addition to paying its other costs. Nice. This, I guess, works with Grist as well. Yeah, there you go. There you go. We're, we're cooking. This card's pretty sweet. It's really good. Yeah, I feel like if it attacks, draws you a land. Great. If it sticks around, turn all your lands into spin spells. Yeah. I think this card's really good. Like uh. B plus. I was gonna go A minus. Right. I think, but no, yeah, I get, uh, there's no ETB. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's a B plus. You're okay. right. You're right. You're right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right, then we get well, to... I, I, for a second, I thought it was enter the battlefield or attacks, but it's Yeah, that would, that would be really, really good. <laughs> uh, we've got Thief of Existence, which is one colorless green. So again, sort of a gold card here. It's a 3-4 Devoid creature. It's a rare. When you cast this spell, exile up to one target non-creature, non-land permanent in opponent controls with mana value four or less. If you do, Thief of Existence gains. When this creature leaves the battlefield, target opponent draws a card. Eh. What was that noise? Was that an unhappy noise? I think so. It seems okay. What? what, what why? Why? Did, 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 isn't this thing really good? I saw, well, oh, non-creature. Non right? non yeah, 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 yeah okay, non-creature. Okay. Oh, it was creature. Great, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. I get it now. I get it now. Okay. 
but that's still uh it's still it fine still, right which is like yep. something you really want to answer cleanly because yep. it doesn't two for one anymore yeah generally this this exchange of like exile something and then your opponent draws a card at some point afterwards or just in exchange for it is a favorable exchange for the most part it's not actually a two for one but your your opponent has spent mana you get to blow something up the card that they draw is random so it might be better might be worse but if you're getting something having something good it's often going to be worse so is this thing like a like a c plus yeah i was just gonna give it a c just a little bit hard to, yeah i think just you know a little bit hard to cast not always gonna be something that you're told about casting yeah okay i think it's okay i'll, I'll stick with c plus okay. three four for three Eldrazi. i think the yeah but it is slightly hard to cast Eladomri Corvectal. This is one green green for a 3-3 three, three legendary creature at Mythic. You may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may cast creature spells from the top of your library. And it also has green and tap it. Tap two untapped creatures you control. Reveal a card from your hand or the top of your library. If you reveal a creature card this way, put it onto the battlefield. Activate only during your turn. Nice. Mm. Pretty darn strong. Yeah. So, you know what? I will go with C on the last card. And, okay. And, and even even the light pause with no ETB, I'm going to downgrade that one too. I, okay. I don't know why I'm thinking about that now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've come around. You've come around. What about no, no ETBs is in, in MH3 seems like it, it will matter that there are no ETBs. I agree. Okay. This thing also, it was made me think of it, kind of, kind of an ETB. Yeah. If, if you have enough mana, right? Right. If you can like cast this then cast something else in the same turn i think mostly you're well not mostly but it's not it's not nothing that you get to like untap with this sometimes play a cheap creature put a big thing into play like you play it too you play this play something else get to put something into play yeah like well you can just cast the spells from the top but then if you don't have the mana for it it kind of it spots it to you yeah right? like yeah, yeah yeah that's good mm -hmm. one green green yeah, what I always call it the double double pips on cheap cards is being a little bit worse than it might seem. But uh, yeah, it's a must kill. Like uh, B plus. Yep, I like B plus. Eldamri. Nice. Primal prayers is. Ooh, I wonder. If the, this is a combo card, but I wonder how much of a combo card it is. So this is two green green for an enchantment at rare. Enters the battlefield, you get two energy. You may cast creature spells with mana value three or less by paying energy rather than paying their mana costs. If you cast a spell this way, you may cast it as though it had flash. Right. So I think this is the only... We had the only black energy card. I think this is the only green one. Uh, yes, I think so too. And I think this card is bad and limited. I think so too. Yeah, there, there's a lot of... There's been a lot of like three card combos going around with this that i've seen people post like with like shrieking drake and the the one drop that gives you an energy whenever you have a creature enter the battlefield I, yeah i won't give it a straight f because i do think there is some combo potential that you can cook with but uh yeah it's, it's not a card you you should generally consider okay so you'll go d minus i am gonna go after okay this. I, sounds good i think it's not worth the squeeze totally fine we got uh sewing micro spawn up next this is three and a green for a three three eldrazi fungus at rare it's got the Void, of course. Kicker for one and a colorless. When you cast this spell, search your library for a land card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle. And if you kicked it, exile target land. Nice. So here's a nice ETB. Yeah. And it gets you any land. So it gets you, you know, if you, if you don't have the colorless to kick it, you can just get a colorless source for the next thing you want to cast. Sweet. Yeah, like yeah, three, really good. three mana, three, three, go get a land's good. It's like, uh... Like a, a B B plus ish. Yeah, I was I was just gonna have it to B, but B really good okay. card. And the land is untapped too, for what it's worth. Yeah. All right, so now we're on to some lands here, kind of home stretch of the main set cards. Uh, we have a cycle of five lands, one for each color that enter uh, untapped. Oh, sorry, enter tapped unless you control their corresponding land. So Archway of Innovation is the first one. They're all rares. Enter the battlefield tapped unless you control an island. Taps to add blue. Blue tap it. The next spell you cast this turn has improvise, which means your artifacts can help cast that spell. Each artifact you tap uh, after you're done activating mana abilities pays for one. So it's like convoke, but you tap artifacts instead of creatures. Right, but it costs you two lands to do that. Yeah. So probably enough. Need... This is 
Yeah, I think this is an F. This is an right? F. Yeah, you're just not going to play this card. Island's going to be better than this pretty much every time. Yep, contract the card. Yeah. The right away here is Arena of Glory. So same condition, enters tapped unless you control a mountain. Taps for red. Red tap, exert Arena of Glory, so it doesn't untap. Add red, red. If that mana was spent on a creature spell, it gains haste until end of turn. And you can give two creatures haste if you yeah. spend a red mana on each of them, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This one seems sometimes better, sometimes worse than a mountain. I think you should probably just play this in your mountain heavy-ish, like your 9-8 towards mountains heavy creature decks. I think the opportunity cost is low enough. So are you on like a C plus for this? I would give it a C if we're using your definition of C plus because I think you're going to cut it from a lot of red decks too. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll join you at C then. Okay. I think that's fair. Yeah. Bloodstained Mire. So we do have the five allied color fetches here. More landfall enablers. These are the fetch lands that you tap to pay a life. Go get one of their two colors. So for Bloodstained Mire, it's Mountain and Swamp. And interesting. Or I, I guess these are not better or worse than the common ones. Just a little bit different. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I, I do still really like these. Like, we've talked about yep. a lot of landfall. I might even go back and, you know, if we were to redo the lands now, I might even bump them up. Uh, to, like, B? Yeah, grade. So I think that if this is fixing... Like, you're going to play these in black decks or red decks in most of the time. Yep. Yeah, I, th I think you... Yeah, so, like, chat's just kind of asking the intricacies here, the comparison. So, like, you know, the one life is not nothing, but it's fairly trivial. Uh, don't worry about that. This is just good fixing, or reasonable fixing. Goes and gets whatever you need. Comes in untapped, which is the trade-off uh, between this and the other lands, which make, can make colorless and cycle. Yeah, like, I would I would play this in, like, a green-black deck as long as I had just a, at least, like, one reason. Mm-hmm to want the landfall trigger or the shuffle or, or right. whatever it is. Yeah, Shuff yeah. shuffle's a big thing too, right? So we mentioned there was like the brain surge, the kind of brainstorm variant. Like that's the reason to want fetch lands too, so you can reset the top of your library. So Even Ellen Camry we just saw, sure. that like you can play cards off the top. That's, it's nice to be able to reshuffle yeah. that. Want to give them just a B minus across the board then? I, I'm i going to give them Bs. Just a B. Okay, yeah, I'll join you there. Totally fine. Okay. And yeah, Flooded Strand, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to the other ones when we get to them. Monumental Hedge is the white card in that cycle we just talked about. So enters the battlefield tap unless you have a planes. Two white, white. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a, a historic card from among them. Put into your hand the rest on the bottom in any order. And historic cards are Artifact, Legendaries, and Sagas. So there are some of those in the set. Yeah. Quite a, quite a good number of Legendaries. Quite a good number of Artifacts. Equipment, living, living weapons, sagas. I think this one's pretty good. Yeah, I, I definitely like this more than a planes most of the time. Yeah, for sure. Like, let's um, just say you had yeah. one hit in your deck. You would play this still, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it gets better. It also gives you information. Like, I wouldn't play it with zero hits, mm -hmm. but it does give you information. There is some upside there. Yeah, and that so sounds... Uh, That's very good, yes. Yeah. What was it? C plus? Yeah, I like C plus for Monumental Henge. Okay. Polluted Delta is the blue black fetch. Shifting Woodland. This is the green land. It comes in tapped unless you control a forest. Delirium, which means you have to have four different card types in your grave uh, to to activate this. Two green green. Shifting Woodlands becomes a copy of target permanent card in your graveyard until end of turn. Yeah, it doesn't tap it. No, it doesn't tap. So you can block with that creature like, or whatever it is. It seems like insane for constructed yeah you like you you know you get omniscience in your grave and just make a turn four omniscience or whatever it's still pretty good limited though right i think so yeah, yeah. just like become a copy of anything that died or you milled over yeah so it's like a good creature land i would say that needs a little bit of massaging work you can't just activate it on turn five when you have nothing else to do but i like it yeah like a like a b minus yeah i like b minus for shifting woodland okay Last one here for these kind of lands. Spymaster's Vault. Enters tapped unless you control a swamp. Black, tap it. Target creature you control connives X, where X is the number of creatures that died this turn. Hmm. Pretty good. Yeah. There's going to be times where the plus one plus one, like when you can 
add a counter to something that cares about, you know, do you mm. have a counter to enter it? Absolutely. Like you, you make it either an Eldrazi spawn or you, you return a permanent from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah. Or you give menace or like there's this, this thing can be really good sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. Like, similar, similar power to the green one. I, I think I so too. Think it's all good. Yep. Yeah. Yep. B minus then? Yep. Cool. Windswept Heath, the green white fetch land, Wooded Foothills, the green red one. Ugin's Labyrinth is a mythic land. It has imprint, which means you can exile something when you play this. When Ugin's Labyrinth enters the battlefield, you may exile a colorless card with mana value 7 or greater from your hand. Tap it to add colorless. If a land was exiled with Ugin's Labyrinth, instead add colorless, colorless. So it's a soul land adds two mana you can also tap it to return the exile card to its owner's hand yeah if, if a card is exiled not, not a land right? sorry, sorry 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 if, if a card is exiled my bad yeah. yeah interesting design on this better than wastes which is a good place to start <laughs> better than waste in in 99 of the cases yeah where, you know you're cultivating or whatever sure sure you do probably like a lot of decks don't want to play wastes, right? Because you just have better ways to add colorless. Right. So if if your deck wants a waste, the discard's great. But the question is if your mana's kind of tight for likely blue and green sources, because I'm imagining this is more of a blue green card, how many hits do you need to make this thing good? Mm, if you're already tight on sources, I'm the kind of player who probably would lean towards not playing it it's tapping for double mana is strong is busted like, yeah busted even <laughs> there's a few things that destroys the land in which case you're really screwed right like if you exile something True. and then they kill your land you're, you're in big trouble yeah there's like the mdfc but, that destroys a non-basic yeah there's the green rare we just saw that kickers to destroy a land But I think this card's like if you have four hits. Yeah, that's that's what I would say too. Then I think this card starts to get really good. Yeah, almost like a splash. Yeah, yeah, I, I think this is gonna be a card that the stamp I would just put on it is it's very powerful. You can't play it if you're too short sort on sources for your colored cards. Like sometimes you're just gonna instead play one of the fetch lands, the colorless fetch lands. But yeah, like you said, it's busted if it's good. If you have that four or five hits. Yeah. Um, I Does this get a build around grade? Probably. I think it has think to. Like yeah, it has to. Build around B? Yeah, that's what I would do too. Okay. All right, yeah. Cool card. Uh, Coslex Command here. Some colorless cards to close this out. X colorless colorless for a kindred instant Eldrazi at rare. Choose two, like any command does. Target a Target player creates X01 spawn tokens. Target player scries X, then draws a card. Exile target creature with mana value X or less. Exile up to X target cards from graveyards. Hard to cast. Mm -hmm. Colorless Especially colors. Because colorless colors, but also like... So typically when you do cast this, it's going to be pretty late in the game. But the fact it doesn't draw X, right? Like it's, it's only draw one card. Yeah. Uh, there is, like, a cap on how good this is, but I, I I still like this thing. I think it's good. Yeah, so do I. Even if you're just, like, scry X, scry, scry X draw a card is not, like, it's kind of uh, Pillage the Bog-esque, or you're digging pretty deep. Well, I think most likely you're going to choose the first and third abilities. Yeah, make a bunch of spawns, kill a thing, or exile yeah. thing. Yeah, like, make, making, case... like, say you do it for four, it's pretty good. Six mana. Exile thing, make a bunch of blockers or mana. Yes, that sounds that sounds really good to me. Yeah, I like that. Like uh, a B. Yeah, I would say Better B. Now? I I think okay. you you have to respect the uh, the typical mana cost rules where you need seven at a bare minimum, eight sources of colorless in your deck. But I think these Eldrazi decks, as long as you're prioritizing a few lands and have the spawns, they, they are going to be able to get there. Yeah, when, when the sets first started getting spoiled, I assumed that anything that had double colorless in its cost was just going to be, like, stone uncastable. Mm -hmm. I do think they've well seeded yeah. the amount of colorless sources if you're looking for them. I do too, yeah. Okay, B for Kodzos Command. Okay. 
Disruptor Flute is a two mana artifact at rare. It's got flash. As it enters the battlefield, you choose a card name. Spells with the chosen card name cost three more to cast. Activated abilities of sources with the, uh, the card name can't be activated unless they're mana abilities. Not a not a limited card. Nope. Constructed card. Yeah. Winter yeah. Moon. Similar. <laughs> uh, two mana for an artifact. Players can't untap more than one non-basic land during their untap steps. Uh, I mean, I guess you could sideboard it in against that <laughs> Abzan thing where they're like trying to play seven different land types. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you probably just give this out. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Echoes of Eternity. We've got a triple colorless card here. So there's a three colorless, 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 six mana Kindred Eldrazi enchantment at rare. If a triggered ability of a colorless spell or you control or another colorless permanent you control triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. Whenever you cast a colorless spell, copy it you may choose new targets for their copy so it's a double down necro duality but it costs real it's really hard to cast and it's six mana yeah i think it's too hard to cast. i think so too yeah i, th I think this one is a, a gentleman's f yes yeah okay devourer of destiny five colorless colorless for a six six eldrazi at rare you can reveal this card from your opening hand if you do at the beginning of your first upkeep, look at the top four cards of your library. You may put one of them back on top of your library. Uh, yeah, put one of them, those cards back on top of your library. Exile the rest. So, you, you know, they get deleted from the game. When you cast this spell, exile target permanent. That's one or more colors. Hmm. Yeah, this thing seems decent. Yeah, it's like a gigantic flame tongue kavu chupacabra that if it's open, your opening hand, you get a bit of selection. Yeah, it won't always kill the thing you want. Yeah, for sure. Can't kill other other Eldrazi's. Yeah, Writh Writhing Chrysalis and Wumpus mm -hmm. and whatever are all safe from this thing. Yeah, but even in those decks, like you're gonna have targets. You just might not be able to kill the actual best thing that they have. I like the blue green devoid decks. You're you're not gonna have a lot of targets. I no. still think it's good. Yeah. But like, I guess you hit like the looter or something. There's probably something in play. Yeah, there's probably something. Mm. But it is a seven mana six six, so you want to you want to hit something. I was yeah, I was just pretty. thinking that. I I think this card is actually probably a little bit worse than it might seem. Like a little bit hard to cast, not really hard to cast again, but a little bit hard to cast, a little bit small, a little bit conditional on the exile clause. Oh, Chad just mentioned it's the last last ability is not optional. So oh, if that's funny. With a colored permanent, it, it's gone. Yeah, big oof. Mm hmm. I I still think you'll have targets by turn seven most of the time. Yeah, I think so too. I think I'm gonna give this a C. I was gonna go C plus, but okay. yeah, yeah. I think I think like I said, it's a little bit worse than it looks. Null Drifter. Here's a cool one. Seven mana for a four four Eldrazi. With uh, it's a, it's a rare. It doesn't have devoid. Funny enough, <laughs> almost it's colorless. Of course, it has some blue mana, but yeah. it's colorless. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you cast this spell, you draw two cards, like Mall Drifter. It has flying and annihilator one, which is I think the first instance. So I'll read this today. Whenever this creature attacks, defending player sacrifices a permanent, and it's got evoke, just like Mall Drifter for two and a blue, which means when you cast this spell for its evoke cost, you sacrifice it. So you just get to draw two. Yeah, divination split card. Uh, I would much rather this thing was a three five. To dodge the deal fours in red. Yeah. Yeah. Still think it's good, mm -hmm. but the four four body is less. Like I, I think I'd rather it was a two five. Yeah, yeah. It just hovers over, makes them annihilate each time. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um. B minus? Yeah, it is nice because I think basically every deck is going to play this. I mean, like a red white deck probably doesn't. Yeah, it's. If you evoke this, you don't trigger the, the 7 CMT stuff, right? Like that's. that's. Uh, you do, yeah. You do? Yep. Okay. Yeah, because hmm. mana cost can't ever change. Uh, okay, I'm going to go up to a B then. Okay, yeah, I like B. Flexible. Okay. Harragast, Erupting Nullkite. This is a 9-mana 6-6 legendary creature at Mythic. 
It's got a merge for six red red, which again, you can cast a spell by sacrificing a creature and paying the emerge cost reduced by that creature's mana value. When you cast this spell, you may exile your hand, and if you do, draw three cards. It's got flying, and each creature spell you cast has a merge. The emerge cost is equal to its mana cost. Yeah, lock line of text doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. but uh, six six draw three flyer for nine mana, kind of, because you're you're not usually gonna have a hand by the time you cast this. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So it it is. I I, I guess. Maybe there's not a great answer to this. I was going to say, is it more of an Eldrazi card or more of a red card? I guess it can be both, but I think your, your Eldrazi decks are closer to... Oh, yeah, you know, red-green is, is Eldrazi color, too. I was, gonna, I was thinking just mostly blue-green, but yeah, obviously the red-green cast this card pretty easily. I do think it's more of a red card. Right. Nine, nine is a lot, even for the Eldrazi decks. It's castable. Yeah. Like, I, I think we're going to get to a few other expensive rares here in a second, but... I do think this set, like back in Rise of the Yeldrazi, you did eventually end up casting the nine and the ten mana, and even like the mythic, uh, you know, Ulamog, Kozlek, Emrakul style cards. You had to do some work. You had to make sure you had enough spawns, but it's doable. Yeah, well, in that set, like seven was like not a problem. No, for Eight sure, was usually fine. But once you got to nine, like every extra mana, we talk about this a lot. Usually, it's the break point is like six, seven, eight. Add add two mana to that. It still holds true. Mm -hmm. Luckily, this doesn't always cost nine. But... Yeah. No, I think this card's good. I, I I like it a lot. I think, like you said, you're gonna be drawing. You're basically refilling your hand at that point. And if you have a card or two in hand, you you might be just fine cashing them in for three new cards. Yeah. I I don't know what to give this. I think it's a good payoff, not an amazing one. I'm going to give Harrogast a B. Okay. I can I see was... being wrong on that, though. Well, I'll just I'll just join you. I think, okay. I think that's real. Yeah. Okay, now we've got some other expensive cards. Kozlik, the Broken Reality. The three main Eldrazi Titans are back. This is a 9-mana Mythic 9-9. Nine, nine. When you cast this spell, up to two target players each manifest two cards from their hands. So it's going to be just you. You're not going to target your opponent. Uh, for each card manifested this way... You draw a card. I guess there's a chance you do that. Other colorless creatures you control get plus three, plus two. And to manifest the card from your hand is just to put it face down as a two-two. You can flip it up for its mana cost at uh, at any time. Yeah, I, I think you might not mind manifesting for your opponent. Yeah, I totally took it back because your opponent's gonna. Yeah, no, no, I, I instantly as I read the last line, I, I was thinking like, oh, that's a commander line to text, and then I read the last line, I'm like, ah, oh, I spoke too soon. <laughs> Yeah, because just making sure they don't have, you know, the removal spell or whatever, the, yep. the Wrath, whatever it is, is... Well, I think the Wrath is an instant in the set, maybe? I don't remember. Or just that they're but, holding removal uh, spells, right? Like, you, you manifest the removal spells, that means your cause, like, goes untouched. Yeah. Card's Still good. not amazing. No. Nine mana's a lot. And you're... Especially when you cast this card, you're not always going to manifest cards for yourself. Like, this is a lot of the time going to be the last card in your hand. Yeah. But it is like a huge anthem for that type mm -hmm. of deck. Mm -hmm. It's like another, like another B yeah, type of thing. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like B for Kozilek. Ulamog the Defiler, 10 mana, 7-7 seven, seven mythic. When you cast this spell, target opponent exiles half their library rounded up. Ward, sacrifice two permanents. Ulamog enters the battlefield with a number of plus one, plus one counters on it equal to the greatest mana value among cards in exile. And Ulamog has Annihilator X, or X is the number of plus one, plus one counters on it. Yeah, better than the nine drops, but costs an extra mana. Yeah, I think, like, like appropriately better than the nine drop. It's better, but not, like, leagues better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is it is, is this also just a B? I would say so. Yeah, and this is all again. Once you know, we've, this is something we've we've mentioned a few times with this set review. But like, B in the right spot. You got to make sure you can be able to cast it. Uh, yeah, ten... when we when we talked about the like worn power stone and the blue green that tapped for two mana the other day, and we were saying, well, there's stuff you can ramp into. Like, this is the kind of stuff mm -hmm. you want double producers for. Yeah. And yeah, chat saying dies to removal, but like, don't like. Sack two permanence ward. Like, that's that's not exactly... I don't think that qualifies for the dies to removal argument. 
yeah, it's a three for one, and they get rid of half their library. Yeah, which, which could, could matter. Could matter for sure. All right, cool. Next one is the uh, they they came as three Emrakul, the world anew, twelve mana for a twelve twelve mythic. When you cast this spell, gain control of all creatures target player controls. It's got flying protection from spells and permanents that were cast this turn, which is like. Uh, pr- protection from removal spells plus, like, Oblivion Ring effects is kind of what it, it stops. Would Emrakul of the World Anew leaves the battlefield, sacrifice all creatures you control. It's also got, I think, a mostly irrelevant madness cost of paying six colorless mana. And madness is if you discard it, you can pay six colorless mana to cast it. Yeah, there is a, a number of ways to discard it, but getting that six colorless mana symbols is almost impossible. Mm-hmm. Like, by that point, you can probably just pay 12 for it. Yep. Uh, 12 is a ton of mana. Yeah, that's to the point where, like, you really, really, really have to have a lot of cards that support this. It's like a, like a D for me, I think? It's worse, yeah. Obviously a very, very good effect. Like, you're going to win the game when you cast it so much of the time. Gonna give it a... Oh. Sorry? 12 mana. I know, I know, yeah, yeah, 12, 12 is a lot, obviously. I, I don't think I'm going to give it that low of a grade because I, I think you can build a deck where Emrakul is castable reasonably. And, and maybe, maybe this isn't true as the format goes on and if, if these Eldrazi decks be, end up being some of the better ones, you're just not going to get a density of ramp cards. So, yeah, you know what? I'll join you. I'll join you at the D. But it's possible if you have enough, if you happen to have enough. Okay, so now we have... Some cards that are not, you know, on the, the quote-unquote main set. They are... Oh, sorry. Not sure exactly. There's the bonus list cards, uh, the bonus sheet cards, the reprint cards. We're going to talk about those. And there's also some commander cards that are in the set and some special guests that are in the set. So we'll get to those uh, accordingly. First one here, reprint card, Kalia of the Vast. This is one red, white, black. Four mana for a mythic 2-2 two, two flyer. When it attacks, you can put a angel demon or dragon from your hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking that opponent this is an f right (laughs) yeah so worth noting for these next section of cards uh there is a slot specifically for these just like a bonus sheet Mm -hmm. uh the special guests just like the past couple of sets are like super mythics where you're basically never gonna see them i think you get one special guest card in every like two boost two booster boxes or every like 64 packs basically don't exist and then there's also the commander cards which are slightly more common than the uh, special guests i think they're about three times as as frequent so still pretty rare in terms of mythics but you will see those every once in a while yes. anyways just yeah packs and the rest of the pack is mostly the same you get the commons you get the uncommons and the basic slot is 50 percent of the time a basic and 50 percent of the time a regular common so you will have more draftable cards in packs closer to OTJ than you did in MKM when there was always a basic in every pack. Great. Yeah, I no, appreciate you laying that out. I'm not talking about the card at all because this card is just enough. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Hard to cast, not enough support. Brea Ethereum Sculptor up next. This is white, blue, black, red. So all colors except for green for a 4-4 legendary artifact creature at Mythic. When it enters the battlefield, you make two blue 1-1 flying Thopter tokens, and she has an ability to sacrifice two artifacts to choose one. Brea deals three damage to target player or planeswalker. Target creature gets negative four, negative four until end of turn. You gain five life. I think this thing is going to be castable if you had wanted to sometime, but Mm -hmm. it's just not good enough. It's it's, Yeah, it's good, but not four colors of mana good enough right Right. it's just it's not worth like doing that extra little tiny stretch you'd need to do to your mana base to make it more reliably castable yeah i think he already had some deck that could pretty easily cast these colors you'd be like okay yeah i'll put that card in my deck it's pretty good but not worth stretching your mana for yeah just just another up i don't think so i think you're gonna play the card sometime so i'll give it a d plus but yeah a d plus yeah i think so hmm Okay, it's strong. I will go. I will go D minus. Okay, and we'll we'll put that as a as a differentiator. Orum's chant up next. Single white mana for an instant rare. It's got kicker for a single white mana. Target player can't cast spells this turn, and if it was kicked, tar- uh, creatures can't attack this turn. 
F. F. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just breezing through the F. Savine's Reclamation. Two and a white for a sorcery at rear. Return target permanent card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. If this spell was cast from your graveyard, you may copy the spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. And how do you do that? Well, it's got flashback for four and a white. This was in a, a real set, right? No, this is a commander card. Oh, okay, okay. Thought it was during my, my gap, but it, it looks uh, it looks fine. Yeah, pretty good. It's a lot of value. Like, reanimate something. Probably, like... Mm. I was not. I was gonna say probably not getting your three mana worth the first time, but that could not be true. Just reanimate a three drop. But even if you reanimate a two drop the first time and it just sits in your grave and get back two things later, that's that's not bad at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this card. Like a C plus. Yeah, exactly. C plus for Savine's Reclamation. Recruiter okay. of the Guard. Two and a white for a one one at Mythic. When it ETBs, you search your library for a creature card with toughness two or less. Reveal it. Put it into your hand and shuffle. I think you need busted things to get to make Good this things. playable. Yeah. You don't want to just be like it's a it's a like a elvish visionary that costs one more, gets a okay card. So you have to get something good. Yeah, like you said. one more card is like you can't Huge. gloss over that, right? right? We always talk about how much how much each mana is like so important to each mm -hmm. card. Uh if you have like an a Johnny or like yeah, grief or solitude or whatever. Like you know, there's there's some busted cards you could find with this. Then you play it. Otherwise, I think you don't. Yep, agree with that. So like uh, C minus. Yeah, I think so. Oh, and like, I guess like D plus? yeah, I was gonna go. Yeah, I think more D plus. Kind of like the Brea, okay. where it's like it's it's a fine card to cast if you have the conditions met, but you're just not gonna play it that often. No, 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 Alex. Bray has a D minus. My, my. Oh, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Estrid's invocation up next. This is two and a blue for an enchantment at rare. You can have it enter the battlefield as a copy of an enchantment you control, except it has the beginning of your upkeep. You can exile this enchantment. If you do, return to the battlefield under its own control. Another F. Yeah, it's yeah. there's. I'm gonna give it a D minus. Okay. I think there's like a spot. This is not an unplayable card, but it's pretty bad. Okay. Yeah. Kappa Cannoneer. This is five and a blue for a four-four artifact creature at rare. It's got improvise, so you can tap your artifacts to pay for a mana for this. It has Ward Four, which is pretty close to hexproof. Not quite, but it takes a lot to kill a Ward Four creature. Whenever Kappa Cannoneer or another artifact enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on Kappa Cannoneer, and it can't be blocked this turn. So, weirdly, oddly, with this card, uh, it. Is it triggers itself, so it's just a five five. Yeah. Yeah. Which it's the it's the magic number. Yes. So. Exactly. So if so, you have like one artifact and this costs five, I think you're happy with it. Yeah, five mana five five pseudo hex proof. And it can maybe like become unblockable later. Yeah. Yeah, because like even in your like in your blue white decks, you, you know, there's there's quite a few artifacts. There's some like servo tokens, the blue white common. I think this card's pretty good. But it, are there aren't any blue artifacts, correct? Are there? Mm, I don't think so. No, I don't think. Yeah, I can't think of it. I didn't. So. I didn't look this one up. No, I think it's just. This is also going to be a super nice one to like splash in red black. Like there's the artifact yeah. that adds three energy, taps for colorless, and you can pay an energy to tap it for blue why is it not black or red chances because it's a reprint <laughs> I, 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 I'm fine with this not being black or red like it's yeah. it would be really busted in the black red decks if it was black or red oh yeah this is another combo card with the blue tamio saga that you can discard cards to make uh, make clues that's kind of funny put a lot of counters on it even with well even with the uh, like tamio is also the one mana flip walker right? yeah that makes, yeah, yeah. Uh, that makes clue tokens yeah yeah yeah, this this card has a lot of things that can work with it, and it's a good payoff. So I you don't hey yeah, good sorry no no you don't play the, you don't play this with zero artifacts though right no 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 just six mana yeah, five five five, no. five five board four not worth it yeah yeah oh yeah yeah Canadian Bacon's post that uh, points out there's bespoke battle wagon the vehicle right. is a blue artifact but, yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. I think there are enough artifacts littered throughout the set that you're going to consider this card quite often. Either splashing it or playing it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give Kappa Cannon Air a B. B? Yep. Uh I I think assuming you're gonna play this more often in yeah, blue red, blue black, or splashing in red black, 
I'm going to give it a B plus. Okay. I think it's a pretty scary card. Yeah, no, it is a scary card. You're right. Ophiomancer. Speaking of scary cards, this is two and a black for a 2-2. Two, two. Human, human Shaman at rare. It, uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have no snakes, you make a 1-1 one, one black snake creature token with death touch. I, I did look up if there's other snakes in the set. And there are. Can you, can you, can you remember any of the snakes? Uh, there's Disciple of Ronus, the one for mana production creature. Yeah, and then there's one more. Uh... And you're, you're never going to guess this. <laughs> I will not even have you try. I, what is it? Yeah, it, yeah. It is the two and a blue four spike creature. Oh, that's a snake. It's a quaddle. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So be careful about that. But this card's really good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, the, the opponent has to kill it or else combat just doesn't happen. They, they can't attack into this um, because you just eat a thing, you turn to make a snake. Even if they... Like, you get gotten if you cast this and they have a removal spell before they untap. But any other right. time... You, yeah, good. Well, the idea... I don't know if you explicitly mentioned this, but it's each upkeep. So yes. if your opponent's up two, so you immediately get the snake that you can block with on their turn. It's also really good if you have a sacrifice outlet because just every turn it makes a new thing to sacrifice. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. A few minutes is really good. You want to give it an A minus? A? I think so. Yeah, yeah. A minus. Sweet. Toxic Deluge is two and a black for a sorcery at rare. As an additional cost to cast it, you pay X life. All creatures get negative X, negative X on the turn. Yeah, sweet card. Yeah, very strong. It's wildly different depending on the, you know the game states. Mm -hmm. it could be insane. It could be uncastable sometimes. Right. Uh, I think it's like a B plus. Yeah, it's a it's a wrath that is it can clean up really quick starts if your opponent goes one two three just you know really really stops a, a start a quick start is a little bit painful if you're trying to be like okay let's bait them into playing more creatures and you go down to like 10 and then you have to pay five that's not great but because it's so modular you can like have the biggest thing and then just pay four you have a five five still that's that's great obviously so yeah i agree with the b plus there okay Crick, son of Yogmoth. This is four Phyrexian Black, Phyrexian Black, Phyrexian Black for a 2 2 at rare. It's got lifelink and it says for each black in a cost, you can pay two life rather than pay that mana. Whenever you cast a black spell, play plus one plus one to counter on Crick. I know I said I like lifelink. <laughs> Not at this cost, though. <laughs> yeah, th this, this, is, is this is an F. Agree. Yeah. All right, Cursed Mirror up next. This is two and a red for an artifact that, at rare, taps to add red, and when Cursed Mirror enters the battlefield, you can have it become a copy of any creature on the battlefield until end of turn, except it has haste. I think this thing's bad. Mm hmm I, it does add two mana for your affinity cards. It also it's an artifact. gives you enter the battlefield effects as Cursed Mirror enters the battlefield. Right. Uh, I think this kind of card's kind of hard to grade. I'm leaning towards D+. Plus. Yeah, I, I would give it a low grade, but it has some applications. Like, if you're like a red-blue deck, maybe it's something you're interested in at some to some degree. Not unplayable, but not a card I think you're just looking to play. Yeah, interesting, for sure. Are you, are you with me on D+. Plus? Yeah, I'll, I'll join you on D+. Plus. Okay. Next one's not going to get a D plus. This is Lelia the Blade Reforged. This is two to two and a red for a two two at rare. It's a legend. It's got haste and says whenever Lelia attacks, exile the top card of your library. You can play it this turn. Whenever one or more cards are put into exile from your library and or your graveyard, put a plus one plus one counter on Lelia. This so this thing's vintage cube, you know, banger. Mm -hmm. I do think that there's more spots on turns like four or five in limited that this can't attack into than there yeah. are in like cube games. I agree. So I, instead of giving this, the reason I'm saying I'm, I'm talking it down from an A plus mm -hmm. to an A. Yes, I, I think so too. Right, you're okay. not going to have quite the density of cheap removal to get this in. Um, also, people are playing to the board slightly more. So I agree with A for Lelia, not just the slam dunk A plus, but awesome, okay. that's an awesome card. Sylvan Safekeeper. One mana, green mana for a 1-1 one, one at rare. Sacrifice a land, target creature you control gains shroud until end of turn. Is this a playable card? 
I think so. Yeah. Shroud can be awkward because if you go to bestow your creature onto something and then they kill it in response, it's not hexproof. It will fizzle, you know, both of those abilities. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Safekeeper is good. Like it's, it's still in. It might not be for much longer, but it's still in my cube. Shroud, by the way, is like hexproof, but you also can't target the thing, which might have been obvious based on Mark's description there. But thought I'd spell it out. Yeah, yeah, we didn't we didn't explicitly mention yeah. it. Also, an invitational card. This is I I don't want to butcher the pronunciation, but Ole Rod. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Initially, came up with this card mm -hmm. when they won the uh, invitational. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Um, well, let's put a grade on it. Because I, I think that's that's that'll solve any confusion here. I, I'm gonna give Sylvan sure. Safekeeper a a lowish grade, even though it has a high ceiling of like like you face the opponent that just has a bunch of removal, and this this is like just a nightmare for them. You face somebody without a bunch, and this is a one mana one one, which is is you know a pretty large delta. So what what were you gonna give it then? I, I think that evens out to like a C minus. Okay, I had written down C for myself. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's easy to, to like think about this card as like, oh, I just stop all my opponent's removal. But again, some th some games are behind, some games that's not what matters, some games the opponent just has, doesn't have that much stuff. So, Yeah, notably, a chat is like, if, if you bestow onto this, it's still just a creature, right? Like, it's not total blowout. You don't actually lose the... No, no, yeah, if, if you... If you go to the bestow, they kill a thing, you make this hexproof, or sorry, shroud, the creature will just uh, become, the, the bestow creature will just become a creature. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. I, was, I was kind of forgetting about that. That makes totally. it a little bit better, too. Okay. Next up, branching evolution, two and a green for an enchantment at rare. If one or more plus one plus one counters will be put on a creature you control, twice that many are put instead. It's like a mega hardened scales. Yeah, I'm not sold. Mm -mm. like you'd have to have basically every other spell in your deck or almost every other spell put counters on stuff and it's just hard to get that density even like black green also just worse than the like the wombat or whatever that added mm -hmm. an extra one and would have created a separate trigger like this is just this is a replacement effect yep so you're not triggering those things oh twice. true yeah yeah good little rules call out there yeah i think mostly enough a dreamer's d maybe <laughs> Yeah, I'm just gonna go after. Yeah, if you want to go agree. higher. No, no, no. I'll, I'll give it enough. Deserted Temple. It's a land at rare. It taps tag colorless and one tap it to untap target land, so you can untap your Ugin's Labyrinth. <laughs> I think we gave wastes yesterday a a D. Gonna give the same to this. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Phyrexian okay. Tower. It's a legendary land at Mythic. Tap tag colorless, and you can tap it, sack a creature, add black, black. So this one's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a waste that you can sack your spawns to become a, a soul land, add two mana. Yeah, yeah or you're a transmogrant or whatever. Yeah, or... transmogrant. I th I think you're gonna play this card sometimes, like in a black yeah. deck with like a lot of sacrifice fodder. You have this, you know, the uh, active trees and creature. You're in a Eldrazi deck that wants the colorless mana and have expensive things. Right, like this is going to be probably played more often in non-black decks mm -hmm. than it will be in black decks. Agree, agree. And there I think it's pretty good. So you want to give this like uh, in those kind of decks a like a B minus? I wasn't going to go C that high. I still think it's mostly just a waste. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go C. Okay. Yeah, that's more reasonable. I'll agree with that. Okay. Okay, so now we have a cycle of medallions, which are all two mana artifacts at rare that reduce the color or the cost of whatever associated color they are. So emerald medallion, two mana artifact, green spells you cast cost one less to cast, and I think these are mostly not great, right? I yeah, I already I actually already wrote down Fs for both of us for all of them. Okay, I just think that they suck. Yeah, yeah. even even if you're like a mono color deck, would you not play these? I don't think so. Okay. Fair enough. Okay, let's go to the next... Uh, oh, almost almost done the reprints here. Urza's Incubator up next. Three mana for an artifact at rare. As it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type. Creatures of the chosen type cost two less to cast. That is symmetrical, for what it's worth. 
Yeah. Yeah, just imagine your you know your opponent names Eldrazi on this, and then you just untap and pay a, play a six drop. Yeah, that's uh, it's no bueno, no bueno. F. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So now we get to some cards that I honestly didn't even know were we were going to be reviewing until earlier today. This is a set of a handful, I think eight commander cards. These are like legendary creatures from the commander decks that will be in packs that you can draft. First one here. Yeah, I think four, yeah. roughly four percent of packs have one of these cards, so they're they're not going to come up often, but they do exist. We've got Omo, Queen of Vesuvia. Omo is two and a Simic hybrid. It's a one-five legendary creature and mythic. When Omo enters the battlefield or attacks, put an everything counter on each of up to one target land and one target creature. Each land with an everything counter on it is every land type in addition to other types. Each non-land creature with an everything counter on it is every creature type. Every land type includes waste. tapping for colorless yep, now? Yep, it'll be waste. Okay. Yeah, okay. So it's like 1-5 that turns one of your lands into a multicolor land or more once it attacks. Seems pretty bad. And oh, it all unfortunately also gives you uh, a snake, so for, you won't be able to figure. <laughs> yeah, it gives your... you a snake. That's so funny. <laughs> oh, sorry, sir. Correction here. Wastes do not have a type. That is true. So it actually doesn't even do that. Okay. So what? Yeah. What? What, what does that even land type even? So it's is it just taps for five colors of mana? Basically, yeah. Okay. It's like a D minus. Maybe even just an F. Yeah, yeah, I'll stay. I'll, I'll go D minus. Okay, sure. Cool. It's got it's got not totally embarrassing stats. Yeah, that's fair. But, yeah. Jyoti Moag Ancient. This is two green blue. I think these are all mythics, so I won't say that. Two green blue for a legendary creature. It's a two four. When it enters the battlefield, you make a one one green forest dryad land creature token. For each time you've cast your commander from the command zone this game. <laughs> okay, so you're not going to be doing that. At the beginning of each combat, land creatures you control get plus X, plus X until end of turn where X is Jochi's power. So this is an F. You're not tricking me, wizards. Yeah. I am not playing commander. This is not for me. This one might be one that we play, though. This is Satya Aetherflux Genius. This is one blue, red, white, free, three, five, menace, haste. When it attacks, create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of up to one other target non-token creature. You get two energy. At the beginning of your next end step, sacrifice that token unless you pay an amount of energy equal to its mana value. Okay. Yeah, kind of a little mini calamity. Yeah, here. yeah, calamity. That's funny. The menace on this is big. Yeah. Okay. This this one is good. This this is a card yeah. we're interested in playing. Yes, this card is good. It doesn't. A lot of the Eldrazi are cast triggers, so mm -hmm. like ETBs are less frequent in this set than usual. But still, a, a nice card. Yes. I would give that to a B plus. I was gonna go B. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Kaith farmed or famed mechanist. This is one same cost as the last time. One blue, red, white for a three three. With Fabricate 1, so when this enters the battlefield, you can either put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it or create a 1-1 one, one artifact servo token. Other non-token creatures you control have Fabricate 1. So when you, same thing, when, the, when you cast them or when they enter the battlefield, you get that option. And uh, Kate has the ability to and tap either to populate or to proliferate. And populate is make a copy of target token you control. card also looks good. Yeah, this is good. It's a 4-mana four, four Fabricate 1. Or three, three, fabricate one. That's pretty good. And then your other things come with one ones. Yeah, and then you can keep. Yeah, this, this is a good one. I like this one too. I, I would give this a B as well. So you like this less than Satya? I think so. They're pretty close. I think I'm gonna flip flop on you. I yeah? think I'm gonna okay. give this one a B plus. Nice. Yeah, I yeah. think I have this one better. Totally fair. Coram the Undertaker. This is one black, red, green. For an O5, and Quorum the Undertaker gets plus X plus O, where X is the greatest power among creatures in all graveyards. When Quorum attacks, each player mills a card. During each of your turns, you can play a land and cast a spell from among cards in graveyards that were put there from libraries each turn. This looks actually pretty good. Yeah, so it's I think it's going to be fairly large pretty fairly quickly. I mean, you know, an O5, it's not going to be an O5 on 4 all that often, although sometimes. And when it attacks, you get to draw a card. Sometimes. It's, it's all graveyards, right? It's not just Yeah, yours, yeah it's all graveyards, so, yeah. yeah. 
turn four, if like nothing has died, and you can still attack and just like have a reasonable. I mean, both both decks are. I, I haven't hyper geometrically calculated this, but if both decks are playing around thirteen to fifteen creatures, you're milling a card from each of them. Mm -hmm. You're reasonably likely to hit something. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think this one kind of reads. Is this better or around the same as the last cards, I guess, is the question. Similar casting costs. Most likely gets um, in for multiple hits. I think I like this as a B plus also. I, I like this one. Worth noting, it doesn't have the... You can cast, this, you cast that spell with mana of any color, but if you're playing lands from your opponent's graveyards, hopefully that helps you a little bit. Yeah, I like B plus. Dissa? Imagine you hit your uh, opponent's grist. Oh yeah, <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> or your grist. <laughs> That's there's another way, another way to flip grist. Uh, oops, sorry, went to the, the very end here. Okay, we've got up next Dissa the Relentless. So this is two black, green, red for a five six. Whenever a Lurgoyf permanent is put into a grave, your graveyard from anywhere in the battlefield, put it onto the battlefield. Whenever one or more creatures you control deals combat damage to a player. Create a Tarmogoyf token. <laughs> and for those who don't know, Tarmogoyf is a star one plus uh, star plus one creature that's power and toughness, or, or star is equal to the number of card types in both players' graveyards. This is a kind of a cool one to populate too, if you ever yeah. Have to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's got that hasty ability where it comes down and just do the thing, like you know, one of your creatures connects. This one I like yeah. less, but it's still okay. And there's also Nether Goyf, I'm assuming is a Goyf. Yep, yep. <laughs> Two Mythics combined, but yeah. you never know when they are play boosters. It's an interesting card. It's a cool card. Yeah, um, like uh, B minus. Yeah, I was gonna give it a C plus, but C plus. Yeah, okay, sure. I'll, I'll join you at C plus. Fine. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then we've got a very strange card here, Utalek. 